fortune of having uh, Father Malachi Martin uh, at his home to uh, interview, and we're going to be speaking about what is going on in the world today, both in the church and in society as a whole. And perhaps uh, you should begin by giving our listeners a bit of a snapshot of what is going on. There seems to be a lot of events uh, that are confusing and people really don't know uh, how to make out what is happening. What are some of the main currents that are going on in the world today and how does that uh, actually uh, shape up? How can one give some sense to what's going on with all the wars going on, all the turmoil in the church, for example? Yes. Uh, Bernard, it's such a, a privilege to be able to talk to, with you, and knowing that uh, by your technology and by your efforts, we may reach hundreds of thousands of people, because, uh, as you have just said and implied, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, in fact, today, are caught up in this vortex of events, uh, disappointments, threats, menaces, uncertainties about the future, and whether they're Christian or Catholic or not, uh, they all really come down to the same questions. What is happening? Where are we going? Uh, what is the lodestar now that guides us as a society of nations and as Christians and as Catholics? You know, we both have agreed when we were talking uh, off the air a moment ago that what is going on at the present moment is a real war. It's a war of spirits. Uh, and any man or woman who does not know that does not know that there's a real war going on with battles being fought in various places, in the boardrooms and in the bedrooms and on the, in the streets, and in the factories, in our parliaments, in our legislatures, in the Congress of the United States and in the Parliament in Canada and all over the world, who does not realize there's a battle between good and evil, a war, and various battles of that war being fought, then they better sit down and take a good glass of cold water and rethink what is happening around them with their children and their wives and their husbands and their friends and their businesses and their country and their cities and their populations, what is happening. So much so that I feel, and this is not preaching, Bernard, this is uh, straight from the shoulder, as they say, um, I feel that we should mentally and spiritually put this conversation under the blessing of Michael the Archangel, and uh, as you know, his central shrine in the Catholic Church and indeed in the world is in a place called Monte Gargano in Italy, where he appeared and where there was an ancient basilica dedicated to him and which still remains the center of devotion to Michael the Archangel. And the reason I invoke him is this, that um, he is, according to all Christian tradition, he is the general in charge of everything. He is the boss of all bosses, as he got all the angels. And in the nine choirs of angels, Michael's word is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. So let us put that under his guidance. And you know, every time you say the Our Father, the first three invocations, you're using those in unison with, the, uh, with three of the, uh, the seven seraphs who are always before in front of God. And when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, it's the sanctifier amongst the seraphs who's talking with us. And thy kingdom come is the, uh, the proclaimer He's the seraph proclaimer. And the, thy will be done on earth is the legislator amongst the seraphs. Michael even dominates those very privileged beings who are always in front of the throne of God. So in the name of God and in the name of Michael the Archangel and Our Lady, the Queen of Heaven and the Mother of all the living, let's start this good discussion and communicate some light and some, dis some uh, guidance to the hundreds of thousands who really depend on the apostolate of the Word, the Word of God. All right? Okay. Now, uh, it does seem to me, uh, Bernard, and I think we, we both agree, that we must start with the essentials and then go out to the wider field. I think that in the last five years, the most uh, significant event that has taken place is the recent trip of His Holiness to Denver. What did you think of the visit to Denver? Did you follow it? On I TV? followed it. There seemed to be a large uh, turnout of people. All the media attention focused on the confrontation between John Paul II and the Clinton administration. Perhaps you could begin there. Yeah, well, the, I, there's a preliminary remark to be made about the Denver meeting. Whether you like him or not, whether you hate or love the Catholic Church, 
whether you are religious minded or not. There is only one man and one man only on the face of this earth. And it's not the President of these United States, this superpower. It's nobody, it's no film star, it's no millionaire or billionaire. There's only one man who could invade a country, uh, like John Paul II did, uh, stand at the center of it, be greeted by at least 500,000 people, be the focus of the media, one way or the other, for the four or five days he was here, uh, speak in front of the President of the United States and give out a doctrine which was repellent to that man in his foreign policy, in his domestic policy, and get away with it. What man could do that on the face of the earth? Only John Paul II. And therefore those who, like Stalin, are always saying, oh, there's no power left in the church. How many divisions has the Pope got? The famous question Stalin asked uh, Churchill about the, the Pope in, in the war. The answer is, what power has this man got? Why isn't he just like the Dalai Lama? No, they can't neglect him. That means there's a resident power there, and it's not guns, it's not money, it's not political power, because where in the face of the earth today is the church politically powerful? Nowhere. It is this moral stature, this privileged position that the Pope of Rome, the 264th successor of Peter the Apostle, occupies, and willy-nilly, they have to take it. They have to take account of it. You know how many journalists were accredited to the Denver thing? 11,000 for all over the world. What leader, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a desideratum of every leader to have such popularity, even in a sh such a short time, to stand and be listened to by three and a half billion people all over the world at the same time that 500,000 are in front of him, all worshipping. No, 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 we must regard the Denver thing as a, a triumph in its own genre. Now, of course it was hoopla. Of course it was circus. Of course it was PR. And by the way, the organization must have been tremendous because there was right, about 10,000 of them fainted finally with overheating and the cold and the hunger, etc. But the thing was so perfectly organized and everybody received Holy Communion at the end of it all, yeah, at the end of the Mass. In addition to that, as you know, for one whole year, we were very apprehensive about what would happen at Denver because we know that thousands of dollars were poured from the West Coast and from New York into organizing a counter-demonstration. It did not succeed. Nothing happened. They found they were up against that peculiar thing called the spirit, and they decided to retire from the field, to leave it alone. There were some demonstrations, but nothing. Nothing like we, we were... Nothing at, significant. Nothing that we were really apprehensive of, because there were threats, even extending to his life, to the Pope's life. But nothing happened because there was this manifestation of spirit. And when you saw him standing on the podium, whether at, at Stapleton Airport being greeted by uh, uh, President Clinton, William Jefferson Clinton, Bill, um, or whether you saw him uh, standing on the altar at, uh, at the final mass, he was an old man of 73, uh, shaking his left hand, which his doctors can't control, uh, inhabited by a, what they call a megalovirus, which they can't analyze, who's already undergone one operation for cancer, who is obviously old and, and a shadow of the former ruddy self he was when he was made Pope in 1978. A weak voice, not a strong voice, and uh, nothing exclamatory, nothing, nothing inflammatory coming from him, still commanding the respect of these people. You know, at the Mass, at the consecration, this is a huge place where they celebrated this, this field in Denver. There wasn't one sound you could hear a pin drop during that time. And that's the silence of adoration and veneration, because the majority of people there did believe they were in the presence of the Lord Jesus of heaven and earth and his only vicar on the face of the earth. So Denver, no matter how you look at it, was a success from the point of view of publicity, of publicity, uh, and of spreading the idea that there is a testimony amongst the sons and daughters of men that can't be obliterated by no matter how much opposition there is. So it was a triumph, that point of view. Now, but that does focus on John Paul II and his church, and I think that's where we should start, because if you look at this Pope in himself, hasn't it struck you, Bernard, that all he can do finally is the papal trips? He can't reform his church. Uh, he can't uproot the Satanism now rampant in his church. The homosexuality still continues amongst the clergy, the pedophilia. The amount of people going to Mass is not going up. 
the amount of people observing the law is not going up, but he does have the power of these papal trips, papal journeys, in where there's a manifestation and a testimony to the truth. That's all he is doing at the present moment. He is issuing letters, and there's a vast underground of pious people who are following with their prayers and the devotion of the rosary. We can't say it's growing, we can't say it's diminishing. It exists as an underground. But at the same time, there is this poor, beleaguered, tattered Amalian church, its organization. So we have to deal with John Paul II and his church. I think that's the first thing we deal with, because he is an enigma for many people. He's an enigma. A lot of people feel abandoned by him. He appoints bishops that are unworthy of being bishop. We know they are, and we can give their names out on the public radio because everybody knows who they are. He has cardinals who are not really with him, who are in opposition to him, who want him to resign, want to get rid of him and have another pope to their liking. He is not liked by secular governments because he preaches a hard doctrine about uh, population control, about birth control, and about uh, abortion. And about and abortion, where this conflict that's occurred right, and, and between Clinton and uh, that's right, Pope. And fetal research. And the, the extraordinary thing about the Denver visit was that no matter what the media did, no matter what they did to take the light off John Paul II and his message and place it on the squabble between us and the secular powers over abortion and contraception. It didn't succeed. For instance, the newsmen held, at Denver, they held a news conference and they had a group of young people from all over the world there and they tried to get them riled up on the question of abortion and contraception and, male and female priesthood and women ordin women's ordination. And the young people said, we're not interested. The church has spoken and it's all over. We, the media failed completely and they, they simply withdrew. They, they couldn't understand it. They can't understand it. And the fact was that these theologically unwashed media people were trying to claw their way at a 2,000 year old church and they got nowhere. The Spirit of God was with those young people. And similarly, after all the, 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 the wave of articles emphasizing the the, the amount of Catholics who commit uh, abortion and contraception, and the amount of homosexuals there are in the church, and the pedophilia, heaping in, heaping all the offenses of Catholics in a huge pyre in front of the world. The fact is that people stood back and said, no, this is not the issue. There's something else going on here we don't know. And John Paul II himself, I must say, in his press, they're very bad propagandists for themselves. They, and perhaps he, he, perhaps like Rhett Butler, he doesn't give a damn. Perhaps it's enough for him to state the truth and pass on, because he is a pilgrim pope. But so Denver does f focus on the one man who is a key today. You know, Bernard often speculate that if the papacy disappeared, if the enemies of the papacy got their will and wiped out the papacy and made him just another bishop in Rome, squabbling with other bishops, as they do in the Anglican Church and the Orthodox Churches, Within a short time, all Christianity would disappear because the, the lodestone, the lodestar for all churches is their difference or their coincidence with the Roman Catholic Church. Wipe that out, a big black hole opens immediately for every other Christian sect. Let's just stop here for a moment. What exactly is the Pope? Is he the chairman of the board? No, he's not. The, 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 the Pope himself is the 264th Pope and the 263rd successor to Peter. And Catholics have this one thing which everybody else covets. They are the only church, the only Christian group, who have a line, an unbroken line of men going right back through history, 2,000 years, to Jesus of Nazareth, who spoke to the first Pope, Peter. And no matter what their failings were, no matter how much they neglected the church in ways, no matter how many uh, imprudences they committed, uh, all of them, they're, they're our historical connection with Jesus in his mortal existence. We're the only people with that, and that's something we can be proud of. We have that. Despite all our weaknesses and failures, we still have that connection. And you must have that historical connection. If you start in the 16th century, or the 17th century, or the 18th century, or the 12th century, bye-bye birdie. Your representative did not speak to Jesus. He didn't confer on you this, that, or the other. And you know, there are people today, some Protestant bishops and uh, some uh, Orthodox who say, well, why don't, we, why don't we now form a common sort of a prayer where we can all gather, no matter what our differences are theologically, and let us reform it. The answer always is, Christ has not spoken to them. To none of them did he say, thou art Peter, thou art the rock, on you I'll build my church. And uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You will last forever, and whatever, whatever sins you lose, they're forgiven. 
whoever sins you don't forgive, they're not forgiven in heaven either. So we, we, have, this, we have this advantage. That doesn't make us saints, Bernard, by any manner of means. So the Pope is the representative of that. And, you know, the Church has a law in its canon law, repeated always in all canon law, all the various codes of law, which says, Pontifex Maximus, anemone judicatur. The Supreme Pontiff can be judged by nobody. He can't be called in a, uh, lugged into a trial, uh, a courtroom, and tried by anybody. There's nobody fit to judge him. And there's a very good reason for that. Because, you know, you and I, all our lives, we've had somebody above us. <clears throat> I had my father and mother, you had your father and mother. We had the, the teachers in school. I, when I became a Jesuit, I had my Jesuit superiors. And we had the parish priests and the bishops. There's always somebody higher. There's only one man on the face of this earth who has nobody higher. And that is the Pope. And he stands with his back to the people he's the head of and faces the abyss of God. He must answer God. It's a terrible responsibility. Now, whoever has, if any man has not been in that position, he can't judge the Pope finally. He can produce an opinion. He can say, well, I think this is wrong. This is bad. Blah, 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 blah. He committed an imprudence there. He committed a sin there. That's all possible because all men are mortal, including the Pope. He can make mistakes. But as Pope, Nobody has this responsibility of facing God for the people. He is the vicar of Christ. And see, we must, we must remind ourselves that Christ is sweet and loving and merciful and forgiving and pleading. He wants our love. But he also has dignity and majesty. And uh, remember that the scripture is terrible about Christ when it comes to uh, punishment. It says that in the last day, when the Antichrist is reigning, Christ will come on earth and destroy him. And the, 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 the scripture is so contentious. It doesn't, he doesn't destroy him with fire or with lightning. He doesn't make the earth swallow him up. The scripture says merely, spiritu oris sui, he's, <coughs> he's going to blow him away like a bit of dirt. And uh, when, as you know, in the, in the, in the last judgment of, of, uh, Michael, of Michelangelo, Christ is condemning the, uh, the, the, the evil ones to hell, and he raises his right hand. Look at, that, look at that part of the last judgment sometime for about a half an hour, and see the expression of Michelangelo, by divine inspiration, put on the face of Christ and his hand. The impression of power and ruthless, ruthless punishment. No mercy. Depart. He, 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 he cursed into the kingdom of Satan. So we mustn't forget that behind the Pope stands this powerful, majestic figure full of his own dignity, of deity and Godhead, who is ready at any given moment to defend his Pope and to propagate his church. So let's be very clear who the Pope is. He is that, with all his weaknesses. And we have a man who was born in Poland 73 years ago, Karol Wojtyla, uh, who lost his mother and lost his brother and was reared by his father and um, who lived under two terrible regimes, the Nazi regime and the Stalinist regime, and who was elected as it were by accident in 1978, fought the as they say in French, because there was no other man they could find who could bind the factions in the conflict of 1978, September, uh, together, and that was Carol Wojtyla. Now, uh, it's very interesting to, to think uh, of what sort of a church he got he was put in his hands uh, as on a platter when he became Pope on the 16th of October, 1978. Very interesting to think what sort of a church was given to him. Let's stop uh, here for a moment. We see in the church today, uh, within the church, homosexual groups, uh, feminist groups are growing stronger by the day. What is the cause of this? Well, Bernard, this is what I meant by the, the type of church was put in his hands as Pope. Now when we say church, remember this, we're talking about the visible, palpable, audible organization. When you say the church, you can mean one of two things. You can mean that organization, beginning with the Pope, the Cardinals, the Archbishops, the Bishops, the Priests, the Monsignore, the Chanceries, including the Vatican Chancery, the Dioceses, the Parishes, 
the institutes, the magazines, the newspapers, the schools, the universities, everything in that organization as such, abroad and at home, in, a, in the missionary lands and in lands long ago Christian. That's the visible church. We're talking about that church. Right, the, we're not talking about, let's say, the faithful. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the, what is called the Roman Catholic institutional organization, composed of men and women and children, and buildings, and plants, as we say and possessions and money and lands and uh, monasteries and convents and uh, abbeys and, and churches and cathedrals and libraries and museums. That whole, that whole farrago of possessions. That's what we're talking about. The church as the mystical body of Christ is, is, is inhabiting in that but it's also in heaven and it's also in purgatory. And that mystical body is composed of all those in the state of grace. And look, they're on earth and they're in purgatory, purging the punishment due to their sins, and they're in heaven. That is one body, and that's the body about which St. Paul says, and I am busy filling up in my own body the afflictions, uh, the, uh, what is lacking to the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, the church, meaning this mystical body. We're not talking about the mystical body because that, as St. Paul says, is without spot or wrinkle. It's being purified or it's pure already. And it's the church militant on earth, and it's the church suffering in purgatory, and it's the church triumphant in heaven. That is un unattain uh, unassailable. That is in the possession of God and cannot be destroyed. What is human is the Roman Catholic institutional organization. About that we're talking. Now, first question is, what sort of a Roman Catholic institutional organization did John Paul II find handed to him by the cardinals who made him pope? That is a, a, an all-important question. When I was young, I'm 72, the construction, the structure of that church was very simple, Bernard. There was the Pope. The central hub of the church was Rome, the papacy and his chancery, his 50 main ministries or congregations. And out from that central hub there ran pipes of communication. And everything went out through those. Uh, instructions and uh, uh, dogmatic assertions and condemnations and uh, praises and approvals and back came the zeal and the obedience and the contributions of the various parts of the church, the regions and the provinces of the church, down to the little parish priests and the little nuns and their convents and the orphanages. So that was the central, the front central hub and the pipes of communication flowing out. By the time John Paul II became Pope, that had changed. He was handed a machine composed of, again, the central hub of Rome, but now every diocese and every region of dioceses was a new hub. And that goes back to a big change made in the Council and Vatican Council II. There was a famous vote on November 21, 1964. And by the way, we have to think on this for the moment because it's very important. You would say, wouldn't you, that the Pope has supreme power? in the church. Yes. And the bishops have power over their dioceses. That used to be the formal teaching of the church. There was a vote that day in which it was asserted that the, po the bishops shared the universal power of the Pope, always subject to the fact that he had the privilege of overriding everything. But there's a story behind that. The night before that vote, a certain aide a certain uh, assistant to Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, went down to a conference room. He had left his comb or his breviary or something there by accident. He went down to pick it up late at night. And the, the, the room had been used all day by the periti, the theological consultants, and some bishops. And as he was leaving, his heels scuffed a few sheets of paper somebody had dropped on the ground. And he picked them up and was going to throw them away, but he saw the handwriting of a very famous peritus, who is now dead. And he started reading and his eyes nearly popped out of his head because the sheets outlined how once that vote was taken on the following day, they would use it to unseat papal power. It was a, a strategic plan. Somebody had dropped a copy of it. So he rushed back to Paul VI, up to the papal apartment. It was about 11 o'clock at night. And he showed it to the Pope and uh, John Paul, uh, Paul VI said, my God, they intend to use this vote tomorrow to destroy my central power as Pope, my primacy of authority and my primacy of infallibility. So then they said, well, stop the vote. You have the power. He said, no, I can't do that. But I will write an explicative note, 
are famous. It's called Nota Previa et Explicativa, a, a, a note which must be attached to the vote when it's voted on the text, which explains that the power of the Pope, his privilege of infallibility and his primacy still remains, and he can override anything. He wrote that at that night, and it's a long note. And they took the vote the next day, and that vote then declared, formally, the text said, that the bishops of the church share in the universal jurisdiction over the church, which placed them on a par of power with the Pope. Now, the nota previa et explicativa, saying, side by side with that, you must remember that the Pope is superior to every council, and the Pope can make a decision without the Pope, without the bishops. Now, if you consult somebody like, uh, say, the one official, as it were, edition of the documents of the Vatican II, say Flannery, Father Flannery, Dominican, you'll find the nota previa and explicativa is not part of the text any longer. In other words, the bishops took that, dropped the, 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 the cautionary note, Paul VI had put in it, and asserted their own power. Now, from that has flown, has, has, has developed, this new structure of the Roman Catholic institutional organization, where every diocese and every region is now has its own hub. And you see now the whole lines of authority are obscured by tons of committees at every level, the parish, uh, Remember, church school. I, I, out of that has come the uh, National Conference of Bishops, like the NCCB, and its political left-wing arm, the USCC, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And out of that has come the regional conferences. Now the difficulty is, how does the Pope communicate with all that? On top of all that, on top of all that, that uh, new structure, the priest senate and the national organizations of priests and the national organization of nuns, the committees in each diocese, they've sprung up like mushrooms. Now if the Pope wants to communicate, he, for instance, in June of 19, I think it was 1988, he wrote a letter. Take this as an example of his difficulty, dealing with this engrenage, this huge zariba of different hubs querying away in their own way and administering without any regard to Rome at all, or in regard to the central hub of Rome, that the Pope himself and his, and his ministries. Here's an example for you. He wrote a letter to the Universal Church, the Pope, this Pope, saying, asking each bishop to institute in every parish, every week, an hour's adoration, with the rosary and with suitable prayers for two motives that the Holy Ghost would send good priests to the church, and number two, that the chastisements of Fatima would be mitigated. Have you ever heard that letter read? I've never seen the directions carried out for sure. Yeah, there's one, there was one obscure bishop in eastern Poland who was put it into practice, whom I know I have been in contact with, and I have a copy of it. But what happens is, when the Pope writes a letter like that, it goes to the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State, Cardinal Casaroli in this case, who is now retired, scribbles his impressions of the letter and sends it on then to the various diplomatic representatives of the church, say, Kacia Vilan, Archbishop Kacia Vilan, the, the United States Apostolic Delegate here in Washington. He scribbles his notes on it and sends it to the bishop's conference. And they have a committee to deal with these things, a very quiet, discreet committee. And they'll examine it and see what they will do with it. Well, they all, somewhere along that line, it was blocked. They decided they wouldn't do it and therefore they didn't publish it, and therefore the Pope's voice is silent. Now, that's an example of how the instruction goes. If the Pope, for instance, wants to appoint a bishop, he's not the only signature. There will not be a bishop unless there are three or four other signatures with him, and they fight over it because they don't want conservative bishops, they don't want orthodox bishops. His enemies, because his enemies extend right up to Rome. Uh, now, for instance, Another thing which illustrates the confusion or the, 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 the impotence of the Pope as regards his church is homosexuality. Look, you can be sure that already for seven years we have filled his ears with audios and filled his eyes with videos and his cabinet with reports. He knows exactly what's being going on. He knows the amount of sexual homosexuality amongst the clergy. He knows the cardinals who are homosexuals. He knows the cardinals who are Satanists and pedophiliacs and, and the bishops and the priests. He knows all that. But the difficulty is they have entered the church. They are clergy. And for instance, there is no seminary that I know of in the United States which doesn't ask a young man who wants to enter the seminary, what do you think of homosexuality? If he says, I don't want it, I don't like it, I condemn it, he's sent away as pastorally insensitive. 
because there are homosexuals in charge. They've been covering up all these years, shifting their men around once they're discovered. Now they don't want to, they don't want to be without homosexuals. And the Cardinal of New York recently ordained three actively active homosexual seminarians. Why are we to make everything like that? And the present Cardinal of New York, for instance, and its public knowledge, defended the right of homosexuals, active homosexuals, to hold a blasphemous mass and receive the whole communion blasphemously. He said they have a perfect right to this. You shouldn't disturb them. What sort of a mentality is that? It's a mentality which says homosexual agenda is in the church. We will not destroy it because there are homosexuals in the church. What can the Pope do about that? Nothing. Nothing. And time and time again, when we sent reports to the Holy Father, they've gone up a certain distance and then they put it at the bottom of a pile. Nothing is done about it. Nothing is done about it. That's another example of the, of the, the, the blockage in this system. But it means, finally, that um, the Pope is not allowed to exercise his power. Now, it's much more complicated than that, Bernard, because you could say, Malachi, why doesn't he do it? He has the power. Why doesn't he just behead them all? Get rid of them all. If the situation in the church is that bad, why doesn't the Pope simply fire all those bad cardinals and bishops and pro-homosexual ministers, etc.? Because, Bernard, that, that's only part of the mosaic of trouble and decadence in the church. When he became Pope in 1978, he had already made his assessment of the condition of the Roman Catholic institutional organization. He found out that the prayers in the Mass had been corrupted. They had been, somebody had gone through them systematically and eliminated the Catholic element in it. Anything about hell, anything about penitence, anything about God's punishment for sin, any appeal for mercy. Uh, the truly Catholic elements had been eliminated. There are books on this now showing they had a team of theologians who went through eliminating and reforming the prayers in a non-Catholic sense. And why was the Mass changed like that? The Mass has changed like that because they hate the Mass. And uh, as you know, uh, this is one of the biggest mistakes Paul VI made. Instead of, you see, the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council was quite clear about the Mass. It said, let the Latin Mass remain as it is. But you may change the partes populares, that is the credo, the gloria, the introit, the prayers at the end. You may change all those into the vernacular, but leave the canon stand. Now, if that document, voted unanimously, by the way, in the last day of the Council, if that, in 1965, if that had been handed on to the proper uh, agency, it would have gone to the Congregation of for the Sacraments. But it wasn't. John Paul II, uh, I mean, Paul VI, collaborated with a very evil man called Archbishop Annibale Bonini, who was a Freemason, and already written articles on what he was going to do to the Church, and they created a thing called the Concilium. It was a, a council, obviously, the word means. It was a, an agency directly allowed by Paul VI to administer the new right. And then he proceeded to write a new right in contradistinction to the Vatican Council, which said, keep the old right intact in Latin. So Paul VI, his grave error, and those who are trying to get him canonized soon are going to run up against this difficulty that willingly and deliberately he bypassed that which could have saved the Mass and created his own Mass, which, as you know, in its first form was condemned by the Cardinals as heretical, and he withdrew it and created the second one, now called the Novus Ordo, and put it in the hands of Annibale Bonini, whose explicit aim, he says in his articles, is to create a right that anybody can accept, Christian or non Christian. In other words, wipe out the Catholic right. But at the back of it all, Bernard, there was a hatred of the Mass. And there was a hatred of the Mass because if the Mass is wiped out, the Church ceases to exist. Why? Because the sacrifice that maintains us all in existence and maintains some balance of good and evil in the, church, in the world is wiped out. The eternal sacrifice of Christ on Calvary has ceased. And on that day, humanity is finished. In other words, the defenses are gone. Defenses are gone. Now, it didn't turn out as simple as that because we had a man called Archbishop Lefebvre, whom we'll deal with uh, down the line somewhere. But the point was that this is the type of church John Paul II had handed to him. Secondly, then, he found that in, in most seminaries there were heretics teaching, people teaching heresy. 
They were teaching heresy about the priesthood. They were teaching heresy about the real presence of Christ. They were teaching heresy about heaven, hell, and purgatory, about sin. They were teaching heresy about the Pope's infallibility and about the power of bishops. They were teaching heresy and error about the position of women in the church. They were teaching heresy about abortion, contraception, fetal research, masturbation, all the common moral issues that we now are debating wildly today. And it was universal. It's all over the church, north, south, east, and west. And what was he to do? He would have to change, literally, thousands of professors, thousands of bishops. And at that stage, at that stage, he made a decision, which depends on his Polishness. And this is a, a, a thing which we must remember. You see, when he became a bishop in Poland, he was under the jurisdiction of a man called Wyszynski, Cardinal Wyszynski. And Wyszynski was known as the Fox of Europe, because he outrooted the Nazis and he outrooted the Stalinists. And he said, we're not going to imitate Cardinal uh, Minzenti of Hungary, who stood up and said, no, we're going to talk to the Marxists. We're going to make them talk to us. They're not going to eliminate us. And he started the Slavic solution, which was to start talking with the Stalinists, at the same time borrow beneath them in the underground. And so he created a system of universities, high schools, kindergarten, printing presses, newspapers, seminars, libraries, all beneath their noses, and they couldn't touch it. And there were 34.2 million Poles, the majority were Roman Catholics, and they all joined. Even Jews joined it because everybody hated the Stalinists. So he created a parallel structure. That's right, beneath, underground. At the same time, he had this famous mixed committee of bishops talking with the Stalinists. And gradually, they all talked them, and they couldn't touch it because he, he had established also close ties with the Americans and with the papacy, and they, they were afraid to touch him. And the Russia kept on telling the Stalinists in Poland, you've got to manage this, otherwise we'll invade and take over the country, uh, invest it militarily. And, of course, then they instituted, the, his, his underground inst institution organized the go-slow, the peace work. A factory worker who had to wear, say, gloves doing his work would cut up the work of putting on his gloves into 24 pieces. There was, first of all, the thumb he'd put in and paws of his left hand and then the index finger so that he'd never get to work. The work slowed down. The, the economy stagnated so that the economy went down. And then the Stalinists found that they had to appeal to the cardinal to make the workers work. And gradually, they finally came to him and said, you've got to save us from the Russians, from the Soviets. They're going to invade unless you do something. Then they start a real talk. But he beat them on their own ground, the Slavic solution. But he accepted the situation, the status quo as it was. He didn't fight against the Marxists to get rid of the government. He talked to them. Now let's take a look at uh, the situation in Poland as it was, let's say, when he was dealing with the communists mm -hmm. in the 1950s mm -hmm. and 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look at our situation uh, in the church today. In both cases, there's many parallels in that the forces of evil are dominant. That's right. Now, the po John Paul II's decision, almost on the morrow of his election on the 16th of October 1978, was that it's all over. I can't fight it. There is no way I can replace these men. There is no way I can remove these bishops. They'll go into schism. They'll come their noses at me, which they were doing anyway. They'll, they won't publish my documents. They won't obey me. They won't receive me in their countries. They won't practice the devotions I suggest. They will not obey my laws. They already have violated the question of communion of the hand. They're good at their violating in altar girls. They're, some of them are ordaining women already, as they did in America. By the way, we have ordained women in, the, in America who are not priests, but they went through a ceremony with a certain bishop who's now dead and one bishop who's now still alive. So he said, it's all over. Nothing can save this organization. It's thoroughly, completely rifled and uh, honeycombed with corruption. Christ must be abandoning it. And you know, there was a, there's a marvelous priest called the Bacon Priest, Wernfried von Straten, who founded the Church in Need organization. He's called the Bacon Priest because his first thing was to get strips of bacon and give them to the starving Germans. Now he is a multi-million dollar organization that supplies uh, material goods to the whole church. And he gave a famous sermon here in which he said, Christ is deserting the tabernacles. He's walking, he's no longer there. The masses are invalid. The bread is bread and the wine is wine. He's leaving you. Like Red Butler in, uh, in uh, Gone with the Wind, finally he doesn't give a damn. If you neglect him, if you have a bastardized right, if you 
teach the opposite of his law and say this is Catholicism, if you teach children to do what they like and allow married couples to do what they like, Christ is going to walk away. He doesn't need you. So the so, source of grace is dried up then. That's right. And John Paul II saw that and said, okay, the Slavic solution. I will not condemn these bishops. I'll do my best to draw them. I'll make them make their liminal visits. I won't condemn them when they violate my commands. I'll endeavor to persuade them. I will go visiting countries as a testimony, as Peter, so that at least people see me. And there, there is a, there is a, a strong, very strong persuasion that at one stage our lady said to him in August of 1981, by the way, when he was lying in hospital, that as many people as possible must see your face and hear your voice, either in the flesh or in the image or in audio, so that nobody can say, or very few people can say, they haven't heard about you, they haven't seen you, they haven't know there was a voice crying in the desert. But beyond that, that's all he does. He doesn't enforce his law. He can't. He could. But then he says, if I do that, it'll all split to pieces. It's a fragile unity. And Bernard, look at it like this. Is there a, a Roman Catholic institution organization? Yes, a facade. A facade. It's only a facade. It's on the way out. It will implode. <clears throat> People are deserting it. We know that the bishops are not observant of the law. We know that some of them are atheists. We know some of them are Satanists. We know some of them are pedophiliacs. We know some of them are homosexuals. But that's not the chief difficulty. The chief difficulty is that we know many of them has lost their faith. They no longer believe. Let me give you an example. If I'm a bishop, and I can name four right off the bat or in this position, and if I allow what is called a dignity mass in my diocese, and these four do, several, but these four in particular, a dignity mass is where active homosexuals married couples, married homosexuals, men and lesbians, come and go to Mass and receive the body and blood of Jesus. Now look, supposing for the moment that the bread and the wine are validly consecrated, that it's a true Mass, that means that I as bishop allow these people living in sin, explicit sin, the night before or the, an hour before, coming to church, I allow them blasphemously and idolatry receive the body and blood of Jesus. The deshozun, as they say in the language, of, you have only two choices. Either the bishop doesn't believe that it is the body and blood of Christ, he just believes it's holy bread in a social occasion, or he believes and he's a blasphemer, which is worse. But there's no other option. I cannot allow that. But the Cardinal Archbishop of New York does. The Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago does. It's the norm in the United States and yeah. in Canada. Yeah. Dignity masses. So the bishop who allows that, he cannot be excused from either being blasphemous or being a non-believer, in which case he's unworthy to hold the mitre. But they're there. They're there. And um, we had a recent incident here where there was a dignity mass interrupted by active Catholics who grabbed the microphone and started saying the rosary and saying, this is wrong. You people cannot have this mass. The Cardinal Archbishop of New York stood up and defended the right of the homosexuals to have their mass. I leave you and our listeners to draw the conclusion. He must either be a blasphemer or he must not believe any longer. Nobody has the right to blaspheme. I'd like to raise another point here. Now, you've pointed out um, that the structure of the church is basically gone. And let's connect it with another point with the meeting in Denver. Mm. I know a lot of people who have stopped uh, going to Mass, mm. stopped participating in the uh, activities of the official church, Yet at the same time, you go to their homes, you see a portrait of uh, the Pope on the wall, you see a portrait of Our Lady on the wall, a statue of Our Lady also perhaps, and they might show up at these uh, papal meetings. What does that tell you? It tells me this, that they have given up on the organization. They no longer feel that the parish church and the parish priest and the local bishop represents their Catholicism. But they do know that there is a vicar of Christ called the Pope. And they hope that by going there, some light will be given them. But there's a loud cry from those people running through the church, a lament. Holy Father, why have you abandoned us? Why don't you champion us? Why don't you get rid of this parish priest who has a mistress or who is a, a homosexual? Why don't you get rid of the bishop who's teaching us heresy? Why don't you get rid of the schools where they teach our children sex ed, sexual education, and corrupt them when they're four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine? What is this? 
help us. But when they see the Pope coming, they do know and believe he is the Vicar of Christ. And therefore they go there. And they may say their rosary. And they may find a traditional mass which they go to quietly once a month, traveling 300 miles sometimes to get there with their children. Or not. I know people who can't get a traditional mass. And therefore don't go to mass. They say the rosary and they cry and weep at home on a Sunday. It's become weeping day. But uh, that's what they're left with. Now they... They're in a very peculiar position, but that's the decision John Paul II made. He didn't set out on a witch hunt. He didn't set out to, to, on, on, on a, uh, to burn them all up, to cut their heads off, to expel them, to create blood. No. The reason was, not because he didn't want to, because he's a Pole, but it's gone past that point. There is no resurrection of that organization. That's his conclusion. There was no way of resurrecting. Just as Vyshinsky said, there is no way we're going to convert the Marxists. Either we talk with them and maintain some sort of a, a peaceful unity on the surface while we burrow beneath, or else we have no solution but Minzenti, who was a martyr and lost the whole shebang, or Cardinal Teen of China, who fled before Mao Zedong and arrived in, in, in Rome as a refugee. But Vyshinsky had this fox-like mind. He said, no, let's fool them. Let's talk to them. Let's insist they talk with us. And he did, and then creating his underground. So the Slavic solution consists of uh, John Paul II is nourishing certain religious orders with quite a secret uh, vows to him. He's nourishing a lot of people by personal visits. He wants no go organizations. He wants. So in a sense, the faithful are forced into a situation where they're playing kind of a waiting game. That's right. It's a complete waiting game. And, but then it's a burden on them. And I, when you meet them, when I meet them, Bernard, I'll tell you what I, the way I, I, I act. Because you meet them, they're in tears. And they say, well, what's the Holy Father doing? What's, why is he not doing this? And why there's so many people around the place saying that they know what to do and, and saying the Holy Father is wrong and, and I can't find a good mass and a, the priest, they won't hear my confession. They say there's no hell, there's no punishment for sin. It's un-Catholic. I always say to them, look, you have the gift of faith. All that's required of you is to stay away from sin, say a rosary, go to mass if you can find a valid mass and receive Holy Communion and confession at least once a year. That's all that's demanded of you. You're not, you're not responsible for the church. You're not responsible for this parish priest, or the bishop of the diocese, who is a sinner, or for the cardinal, who is just as bad as anybody else, or just as good as anybody else. You're not responsible for the pope. You're not responsible for anything but your own soul. Take care of that and put up with it. That's God's will. That's where he's put us. So part of God's will in our lives is that we simply have to bear this cross That's graciously. Right. That's right. And maintain our beliefs and pray, 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 and keep our faith and inform ourselves. Now there are plenty of books. Now there are plenty of priests. Now there are plenty of organizations. If you want to know what to do, in any case, you have it at your hands if you search. But you've got to search. Because remember, this now is a war. We are now girded for war. We're, there are battles every day of your life. If you want to know, should you have more children? If you want to know, can you practice contraception? If you want to know, is it wrong to masturbate? Is it wrong to support fetal research? Is it wrong to vote for Mr. Clinton? Uh, is it wrong to attend such and such a mass? Is such and such a teacher in the church, a theologian or a seminary professor or a bishop, are they wrong or right? You can find out, if you want to find out. But now it's an effort. And there's this difference too in Christ. You know, when I was young, that was a long time ago, 40 years ago, in my teens and in my early 20s, but it was so easy to be a Catholic. Because we had a Catholic community. We had Catholic teachers. We had a Catholic church. We had a Catholic cops. The community was Catholic. And if, if you deviated, you got a, you, somebody lashed you behind. 
or somebody calls you in. It's always something to hold you, to keep it together. Now, and you can be therefore blasé because you knew there was a safety net. Now there's nothing, no safety net. You're on your own, buddy. You either know the law, and if you don't know it, you get acquainted with it, and if you want to know how, if you have difficulties and you want to get answers, you can search and find it, but you now have to search. The responsibility is yours. You do it now for your children and your wife and your husband or your friends or your family or your factory or your shop. Now you must find out. You can't simply presume you're okay. You're not. You've got to find your own information. But this is the church that we sent it on a platter to him. And he had the decision to make, either do I start a witch and take out my, my axe and cut off heads, expel people, clean, it, clean out these Augean stables of the dirt and the muck, uh, do I get rid of all my heretical bishops? Do I get rid of these cardinals who don't believe any longer and who are in the pay of foreign governments or who are homosexual or that's our Satanist worshippers? Do I do all that? Or what? He said, if I do that, then what it remains of unity is gone. It'll destroy things. Now, he made the decision not to do that, to maintain whatever fragile unity there was. And if he was snubbed by bishops, which he has been, and if he's neglected and he's insulted, I mean, but the, a very prominent cardinal just called him a ham actor, uh, and a very prominent uh, Bishop Weakland of, of, uh, of uh, Wisconsin has uh, shown great contempt for the Holy Father as a person. He never, as John the Twenty Third said about the people who calumniated him, he said, "No, no, I, I've never bent down and picked up the stones flung at me and flung them back at my enemies," and he hasn't done that either. But he does keep on doggedly doing what he does. He's accepted as, as it is. Once a piece breaks off and floats away, he lets it float away. Because that that's the responsibility. Uh, he will not enforce things. He knows things about his bishops that are disgraceful. He can't do anything about it. He's got to put up with them. Sit up, sort of shake their hands, get their, get their kisses ring sometimes. And he must give them their blessing. Knowing that they don't believe any longer. They don't believe any longer. It's a facade. They're now members of a guilt edge membership club. They've got money, they've got influence, they'll never want, and they're friends, and they can find their pleasures. And what can he do about it? He could scupper them all, get rid of them, but then the church ceases to exist as a visible organization. And that's all he has. So he's waiting too, and he's always waiting for the Virgin, waiting for Mary to come. Is that's there an underlying spiritual reason for this uh, crisis in the church. Is Satan being, let's say, especially active now? Yes, yes. The, the, every indication we have that it all stacks up to one conclusion and one conclusion only. These, we know, are the last days of these Catholic times. These Catholic times were the times up to the 90s when the church existed as an organization accepted everywhere and viable and powerful and strong. That's all over. Apparently, Christ has decided that he wants to liquidate that organization and have another one. We don't know what one will come out. We know it will contain a pope, and it will contain bishops, and priests, and the Blessed Sacrament, and the Rosary. Beyond that, Bernard, your guess is as good as mine, or the pope's. We don't know. We know the present one is being liquidated, because nobody in his right senses today will say the church is flourishing. Nobody in his right sense today will say that Russia is converted, that the Baltic states are returning to religion. They're not. Religion is dying down and dying out. Could we have a situation where whole countries apostatize and the faith never returns? We have situations where whole countries, virtually whole countries, have apostatized. Whether they will return or not, I doubt it. I doubt it. Countries don't return until the chastisement comes. That's another subject we'll discuss. But the point is, the present situation, concentrating on the church John Paul II got and the policy he formulated, that's it. And he still maintains the facade. He still welcomes the bishops for their ad limina visit. He still uh, treats them as if they were doing their duty, knowing they are not doing their duty, knowing that some of them are plotting against him, knowing that some of them want him to resign before his time and get out so they can elect a man after their own heart who will be a, an anti-pope. And we will discuss, uh, we'll discuss that. That's an last interview. But at the present moment, it's the condition of his church. So uh, let us Catholics not be at all self-inflated. We have an ailing, decadent, unstable uh, organization, honeycombed with evil, in the possession of our enemy, dominated by Satan, who now has free run for the last time to do what he can before the end, before Our Lady comes. This is the organization we belong to. 
and we have weak parish priests, we have some nuns that are very good, and a veil of them who are in feminist rage, uh, this peculiar new feminist rage, which is anti-Marian, anti-Jesus, anti-family, anti-God, anti-fatherhood, anti-motherhood, anti-sonhood, anti-daughterhood, which is out to destroy everything, which is, of course, Satan's purpose. We're in the grip of that. And let's not, let's not, let's not uh, put a tooth on this either. We have churches in which Christ has ceased to dwell. He has left our tabernacles. It's merely bread because the priest doesn't intend to consecrate. There is no consecration. There's no valid mass. We have bishops who are not validly consecrated. How can they ordain priests? They can't if they're not validly consecrated bishops. So we have, we have this, this, this organization which we can't be proud of. We have to defend it. And we have to maintain our status in it. But we cannot defend it as godly. It isn't any longer. It is now in the possession of Satan to a large degree. And it would be counterproductive for the faithful to go on rages against the Pope uh, for saying, why doesn't he step in and do something? He's doing the one thing, the only thing he could do to preserve some sort of a facade. And remember this, that he is impotent in this sense. That unless he were to disrupt everything in a crusade, against himself, against his own church. He can't change anything. God has withdrawn grace. You see, look, when you and I are tempted, supposing I go into my friend's office and I find that $2,000 lying on the floor, somebody has dropped. I suppose I'm a non-Christian, whatever. And I decide, or oh, grab that. Nobody will know it. And it's 2,000 bucks. I can get at that moment what is called an actual grace from God helping me to resist the temptation. Similarly, if I see a beautiful woman or a beautiful man, instead of letting my lust go, I can get an actual grace from God for that act of saying, no, I won't touch the money. No, I will not lust after that man or that woman. An actual grace. But I won't get sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace comes through the sacraments. Now, supposing your baptism is invalid, supposing your confirmation is null, supposing you don't go to confession, Supposing you, when you receive the, the sacrament, it's only bread and wine, it's not the body and blood, you have no sanctifying grace. And God has a very peculiar law, which we all know about, but which we don't reckon with. Adam and Eve violated his law. I'm punished for that. Law, God has this funny law about human beings in the coagulations. For instance, supposing you and I are married, and I'm a, uh, I, I'm a lush mother, I, I'm a drunk, and you're a crack father we produce a child who is alcoholic and crack. The child never did anything. But God's law is that they go in groups in coagulations. I, the, the Bible says that fathers ate sour grapes and the children's teeth are blunt. The whole race is blamed, as we all are blamed for Adam and Eve. You know, the church has never called them Saint Adam and Saint Eve. No, never. They're not canonized. And he says, we, we, we have some big questions to ask Father Adam and Mother Eve. Why did you do it? Why did you condemn us all? But the, the, we, we were condemned on their say-so. We didn't exist. And all sin and all misfortune and all disease and all death entered the world because they ate the food when they were forbidden. So God, in this case, too, is the same thing. They, 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 uh, he has unworthy priests, unworthy bishops invalidly ordained priests, invalidly ordained bishops. We suffer. He doesn't send an angel to make up the deficit. No, he doesn't. He doesn't even make the Pope put them back, but the Pope can't. And Here's another thing. You can't necessarily count on God intervening at a certain moment and putting everything right. No, he doesn't do that. That's not the way he governs his church. He governs people because people have free will. And either you follow that or else the consequences come on the innocent. On the innocent. Look at the present moment, Bernard, as you and I talk. You can be morally certain, metaphysically certain, that somewhere in America, in the USA, there are 50 to 80,000 embryos living in tanks. These are children conceived and then isolated for experiment. They will never be baptized. They will be killed by force in experiments. Some of them will be used for in vitro fertilization. Others will be used for genetic research. Others used for shampoo and that kind of thing. It's unbelievable. What, yeah, what, where is God? What has happened? Why does God allow that? 
These are, uh, these are what we call the prisoner innocents. We pray for their baptism by, by desire. We pray for their baptism by some means by God. And we pray, I do it in my Mass every day, I baptize them, but a formula used by the present Holy Father. In the hope that there's some measure of, of mercy in God's providence, which we all believe there is, but we don't know it. All we know is that they suffer and they, they remain embryos, but they're living souls. Every one of us is a living soul, saved by Christ, waiting for the waters of baptism. Now, why doesn't God intervene? He doesn't. That's not the way he governs his world. It's a different macro-management principle we have. Coming down to brass tacks for us, though, it means that John Paul II said, all right, the organization is corrupt beyond repair. And Our Lady has said she's coming with chastisements and finally with restoration of the church. I will wait. I'll bolster it. I'll get to see as many people as possible. I'll speak as many languages as I can master. I will visit as many capitals and draw as many people. I'll be seen and heard by as many people in the flesh or in image or in audio as possible. That's all he can do. And wait and wait and wait. And that's what he's doing. That's the Slavic solution. Many people don't understand it. And traditionalists blame him for not reinstating the traditional mass. It's worth his life. If he tried to do that, I think they would kill him. Those who are against the traditionalist mass, they wouldn't stand. Uh, others are angry with him because he doesn't remove bishops. He can't remove them. He, he could, in principle, or in practice, he can't. If he were to violate the rules, the normal rules in the Vatican, he'd have a total revolt in his hands. At the present moment, he can't mail a letter or receive a letter. He can't make a telephone call or receive a telephone call. It must come through the central. Everything is governed by him. He has his emissaries and his friends that come to see him. Uh, uh, it's one-on-one, -on -one, the diplomatic pouch, and he has his own way. But that's a limited uh, activity. He is trussed up like a chicken, and with more than one visitor, and I was there once, he stands up, puts his arm by his side, and said, look, I'm just like that here. I'm a prisoner. I'm trussed up like a chicken. I can't do anything. He's St. Peter in chains. <clears throat> Above and beyond the traditional critique of uh, John Paul II in that he hasn't been struggling with the bishops and the dissidents is a second uh, component uh, of a critique. And this second component of the traditional critique of John Paul II is that he has been meeting with people like the Dalai Lama, setting up uh, the meeting in Assisi, meeting with the voodoo priests in Africa. What is the reason for this? And how do you reconcile it with the idea how do you of, reconcile of the vicar of Christ? Right. Wouldn't you think you should go in front of the voodoo priests and say, I proclaim to you Jesus Christ, convert or be damned? Exactly. That's the traditional critique. That's right. You know, Bernard, the first thing I think we should remember is this. As loyal Catholics, that is, as loyal believers in Jesus Christ, who said, you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The first duty we have is, despite our human conclusions, is to have a prejudice in his favor and to say, okay, let's sit back and look at this and consider it closely in the light of this man's entire history and the condition of the church and the condition of the world. Now, here again, we're up against this basic option John Paul II made once he was made Pope. He was faced with the stark realization that his Roman Catholic institutional organization was dead. It was finished. He was contemplating its last days. And he is, as now we know from various indications, he is the last Pope of these Catholic times. There never will be another Roman Pope of his stature and of his kind. He's the last one. Now, Side by side with that, there's this persuasion he has as Pope that because it is in its last stages, because around the corner comes utter catastrophe for this organization as well as for the human race in the form of chastisements, that a new era is going to open in which the Holy Spirit, which is always moving wherever men are good, no matter what they are, voodoo priests, or Protestants, or Catholics, or Jews, or Muslims, or whatever. He knows that there will be a rallying by Mary as queen of all the living, and as queen of heaven, that she will enlighten people's hearts, that she's coming in the clouds of heaven, 
in her reign soon and that this will touch voodoo priests and orthodox and heterodox and all the people of the world showing them where they stand and what the church is and who she is and who her son is the lord and savior of humanity and therefore john paul II's ministry as vicar of christ to all men he's not vicar of christ merely for catholics or protestants he's vicar for all men he is he represents the father and represents the son and the holy spirit he is supposed to mirror in some way or other the benignity of that before the miracle of conversion takes place the miracle of revelation and his idea is and it's true he examine all his words and i make it my business as for i'm paid to know what he said to the voodoo priests and what he said at assisi and what he said to the dalai lama and what he said to everybody non-catholic who comes to him there's never a budging he never renounces his position he will he told the jews at the synagogue in rome when he visited them which violated a lot of people's ideas we believe in jesus christ a member of your race was the son of god through it happened that was that no mincing of words and when he had uh, the patriarch of constantinople demetrius over there he told him the same thing and when he's speaking with alexei this the scoundrel who's in charge now of the russian orthodox church in moscow the patriarch he's nothing but a scoundrel he told him the same thing there was no budging away from that and remember that i i'm a historian and a theologian i have to go back as far as cardinal bellamin of the 16th century to find a pope who has spoken so clearly about papal privilege on i think it was january 17 of this year he gave a talk in which he was utterly intransigent about papal infallibility about papal primacy nobody can mistake what he says but he insists that he does bear the holy spirit and that in visiting the voodoo priests and in visiting the people in assisi and in having the orthodox the the lutherans come down to scandinavia to st peter's and celebrate some sort of prayer with him he is maintaining his position as the vicar to all men preparing their hearts and souls i and of the parishioners that the, they did see christ one day in this man they had the option to opt for the future when it comes to them in the shape of our lady's reign there's nothing wrong basically with that it does violate everybody's idea of what the pope should be and listen but let me be off the fact with you for one moment and be very human i don't want a pope i shake hands with i don't want to sit at breakfast table and ask him to pass the salt i i i want a pope in amber of reverence i want him i kneel and i kiss the instep of his foot and his ring and say holy father what should i do that's my belief as a traditional catholic but i know that those days are past for the moment he has to behave like a normal man and for instance when he sent a message to the united nations a couple of years ago he didn't say i the vicar of christ the patriarch of the west and the the representative of god on earth tell you this no he addressed me said i john bishop of rome and son of humanity advise you this way this is the accent of jesus jesus you know never said i'm the son of god explicitly he never said i'm going to come in the clouds of heaven and kill you all unless you do what i say no he had this meek and mild invitation come and follow me so john paul ii is preparing in the light of what he sees coming he's preparing disposing souls to look finally and say oh yes he was here that man in white he did fly in in alitalia he did talk with us he does represent the truth this is what he's preparing now it's hard chore as they say in america it's hard fare for anybody to swallow on who believe that the pope must always be recognized by the pope by everybody and should behave himself and keep away from all sinners that have nothing to do with them christ himself was accused of sitting with harlots and wine bibbers if you remember in the gospels they calumniated him so they calumniated john paul ii now look here you're faced with an option i was never pope neither were you neither of us will be pope as far as we know bernard none of us sat in that catbird seat we don't know what weight is on his back we don't know what pressures are on him we don't know what he's been told by god we don't know what revelations were made of and he's had personal revelations we don't know and that we can't judge him 
Pontifex Maximus ad nemine judicator for the judge says in this universal code of laws. We can't judge him. We can have our reactions saying, goodness me, how could he do that? These, these voodoo priests with their devils and their, and their, their mime and everything else, and these, these heretics and these uh, orthodox uh, Greeks and Russians who don't acknowledge his primacy, how dare he talk to them? He should say, go home and either come back to the unity of the church or else. That's not the way of Christ, apparently. There's no, nobody's in any doubt in his mind where John Paul II stands. He says, I am the vicar of Jesus. I am the successor of St. Peter. I am the patriarch of the West. I am the vicar of God for everybody. Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, non-Christian, atheist. My enemies themselves, I represent God. And the big... See, there are things that happen to the Pope that have happened to him that we don't know. For instance, with Michael Gorbachev his visit, his two visits to the Pope. If people think that they discuss politics merely, if people think that Gorbachev didn't ask forgiveness for his sins and ask direction, if people didn't know, don't know what God, John Paul II said to him in his native language, Russian, as to his function in history, then if you don't know, don't judge. You don't know. You were never in that seat. You don't know what pressures are on him. You don't know what responsibilities he has. All you have to do is to believe in his vicarage as Christ's representative. You have to believe that his intentions are correct. He has never yet violated a rule in dogma. He has never announced anything that he should renounce. He shouldn't renounce. He has never given up one iota of his authority. He has never said to bishops, do what you like. They do what they like. He has reproached them as far as he can. But it, there's a certain point he can't go beyond without utterly sending them into total and complete schism and breaking the church up. He wants to maintain a fragile unity until the church comes. He also wants to seed abroad. And there's no doubt about it, if I am a voodoo priest uh, in Haiti, say, but at the same time I meet a poor man and I give him a cup of water, at the same time I resist temptation to sleep with somebody who's not my wife, that can only come about through the Holy Ghost the grace of God. And that grace comes through the Catholic Church, not through anybody else. You know the old conundrum, can I be a good Presbyterian and go to heaven, not become a Catholic? Can I become a good, can I, can I go to heaven if I'm a good Jew or a good Muslim? The answer is yes, you can. But not because you're a good Jew, not because you're a good Muslim, not because you're a good Buddha priest, but because in, ver in the light of whatever good you did under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you get the grace of the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, invisibly but really. Do you understand? Yes. That's the way it happens. So he is seeding all that. Who am I with my little parochial criticisms to say he shouldn't do that? I never sat in his chair. I never faced God, the abyss of God's greatness, with the people of God behind me. I can't make a mistake. I can't afford to neglect the chances. So that when you find him, though, you find John Paul II at the crux, at various crusades, the cruxes of his life, standing for, for instance, with the President of the United States, standing beside him at Stapleton Airdrome, the almighty head of the only superpower existing, backed by everything the United States is. And there's this little frail figure of 73 with his shaky left hand and his, 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 his weak voice. And he stands up and he says, look, you've got to defend life. You have to defend life. Attacking immediately abortion. People say, well, listen, be diplomatic, don't mention that. No, 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 he's going to say it. And he said it again and again and again and again, right through his visit. And it's interesting that uh, Clinton did not give any response. No, 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 he, he didn't dare. He didn't dare. Now, there's a, when we get into the question of what, the world in which this church is, this bedraggled, uh, decadent shambles of a church is, we'll see where all that uh, coheres together. But as regards John Paul II, the wisest thing is to say, okay, I don't understand this. I wish that he simply was other. He's not. But he is the vicar of Jesus. He is sinless in this respect. He has the privileges and the gifts, the personal gifts in, as Pope. I must respect that and wait and pray. Say my rosary, go to Mass, avoid sin, uh, I will my children well, be decent to my husband or my wife. Uh, and do my duty and ref pray for the Holy Father that he have the light because the difficulty, the only difficulty John Paul II has is the light of the Holy Ghost. He must have light because on his behavior and his decision depends so much because he's in the middle of a world where he, with the geopolitics of faith, 
the geopolitics of faith means that he, he has thought of the various political systems, north, south, east, and west, and all the various countries, and of the whole world. Remember, this is a huge four and a half or five billion uh, people world now. He must think of all that in the geopolitics of faith. He must see it all as somehow englobed in God's plan because God sent his only begotten son to save all men, whether they're saved or not. That was the purpose of it. Universal salvation. Whether they benefit or not, that depends on their free will and the grace of God. But he must think of them with the geopolitics of faith. But he also has to contend with the geopolitics of reason, which is what's going on in the world of men who don't kneel down, uh, whose parliaments are not dominated by the crucifix, who have no idea of serving God, whatever. They have an idea of making money and having a good time with food and women and sex and, and power and pleasure. What is happening there with all their decisions, the geopolitics of reason, the way they reason for their security, national, international, and financial. So this is a balance you must achieve with this man. There's no disunity between what he's doing and what he's doing in the world. He has, he made a resolution, by the way, they would go anywhere where men were. He would talk with any body of men, as John Paul II as John, Bishop of Rome, and Son of Humanity, and representative of Christ. And he would do that continuously. Nobody could forbid him to go anywhere, he said. And he will not be forbidden. He would go anywhere, talk with anybody, scientists, or atheists, or psychiatrists, or midwives, or politicians, or, or academicians. He would talk with them all, because he has the Vyshinsky principle. Talk, talk, and build your underground. And that's his principle. And we belong to the underground, brothers, if we belong anywhere because the church doesn't exist as it used to. The visible Roman Catholic institutional organization doesn't exist. I think that part of the problem uh, for many of the faithful, myself included, mm. is that there's a yearning for the situation as it was, let's say, when uh, Pius XII was Pope and he of was course. purely the monarch course, and uh, course, people would course. kneel down and kiss his of ring. Course, of course, and he, he retired behind the screens and he was hidden away in the amber of the papacy preserved in that amber of reverence. That day is past. Let me tell you something. Take Christ. He was, from what we know, a Caucasian. He was about uh, five foot eleven, from what we know of the shroud. He had a strong body. Um, he probably was brown-skinned, as all the Jews at that time were. He was probably dark-haired. From what we know, we, we're speculating on that part of it, his, 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 his pigment. He walked around, and people dressed him as rabbi, master. And when they tried to make him king, he ran, he fled. And uh, he refused to be crowned, refused to be accepted as a leader. And finally they got a hold of him, they stripped him naked, and they scourged him, they, uh, they, they, they trashed him and they crucified him, covered him with blood, and buried his body in a hurry to get rid of him, so that there would be no ruckus with the Romans. Now, of course, I, if I had met Jesus in Galilee, on the, lay, on the shores of the lake, or if I had seen him in Jerusalem in the week of his passion, I'd have adored him, fallen down in front of him. I'd have kissed his feet, as Mary Magdalene did, and adored him, and the disciples. But the wide world didn't. And why do I expect my Pope to be more reverenced than he was. Is the disciple above his master? So John Paul II is saying, okay, they have stripped us of our dignity. They have stripped us of the aura of divine authority. Let's walk as Jesus did and suffer this passion of calumny, detraction, uh, commonization, and, and uh, what's the word? Um, you know, uh, bastardization of my status. I'll still walk with dignity through this passion. So why shouldn't he do that? If that, in his opinion, and he's Pope, is the only way he can get around. Is he getting along with in order to go along? Is he going along in order to get along with? Sure, just as Christ did. Christ went along in order to get along with. Uh, he, 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 he didn't say, I'll wipe you all out. No, he didn't. He went along with it. He was a victim of the circumstances. But being Lord and Master of all circumstances, he turned it to, finally, into the salvation of the Church. Similarly with this Pope, too. Why should we think he should be above his Master? No. We, who know him, should reverence him and pray for him. And we should venerate him. But Mr. Clinton is going to shake his hand. Mr. Cole is going to shake his hand. People are going to have breakfast with him and ask him to pass the salt. Sure they are. 
I call him Mr. Pope or Signore Papa or whatever it is. We have to put up with that just as they talk to my beloved Jesus, the Son of God. They talk to him as if he was just another rabbi. Rabbi, tell us what you think of this. The other rabbi said this. What do you say? And, and ate with him and slept with him uh, by his side and walked with him. How many of the disciples were like that? Even after he rose from the dead, the disciples still said to him, when are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Because they wanted to be the chiefs, the presidents and the, and the, the, the military men. Even then, before, he, before the Holy Ghost came, they didn't understand. So it's no fault of ours that we don't understand. But above all, let us not make a final judgment on this Pope until Our Lady comes, until the denouement takes place, until his vindication takes place. And pray for him in the meantime. He has the light because, Bernard, he needs light, the light of the Holy Spirit every day, more and more, because we are now entering a dark, long night of civilization. And he's the Pope. He's the last Pope of these Catholic times. Let's uh, now <coughs> take a look at this dark, long night which is descending upon the world and the mm. circumstances that the Church finds itself in today. Mm. That's, we're now entering what we call the geopolitics of reason. That is how men reason their way through the politics of the entire world. Geopolitics. The politics of the globe. Because if there's one thing certain today, Bernard, it is that we are now in a world which is already one in a very subtle way that people don't realize. Today, all the, all the money markets are globalized. What happens in Tokyo, in the Hang Seng, is takes place in New York. What happens in Singapore, and in London, and Paris, and Rome, all these money markets are in one global situation. There's no, there's no separation any longer. The flow of capital and the flow of capital goods, by which nations live or die, by the way, that flow is determined by these markets. And the, our money is influenced by the yen, by the mark, by the franc, and vice versa. We now are in a, a new situation completely where already we are financially one, whether we like it or not. Whether we like it or not, we're financially in one ship. There are no national economies anymore. No. Trillions no. of dollars of flow every day they, they, between borders without any hindrance. Because the men running it have no borders themselves. They're not French, they're not Chinese, they're not Americans, they're not British any longer. They're citizens of the world who have vast holdings. Now remember that every day on the international markets, something like uh, $600 billion is sloshed around in various deals. And there are hundreds of thousands of small investors, anything from 20,000 to 200,000, small, picky investors. There are about 60 or 80 men, some women, but mainly men, who play with anything between 40 to 80 billion. They decide what nation lives and what nation dies. They decide if Somalia is going to be saved. They decide about Bosnia Herzegovina, not the politicians. Why? Because they have the money. And it's not that they're merciless. No, they simply are very, very wealthy and they grow more wealthy. And their interests are universal, they're global. They decide our money. And they finally will tell Clinton what not to do. And he has not to do that, and he has to do what they tell him. Because we now, remember that nationalism is no longer strategic. Uh, we don't need any longer to have a nationalism in order to survive today. But there are things that we have, and here's where the Pope comes up. The first geopolitics of faith, the clash between geopolitics of faith and geopolitics of reason takes place in the question of birth control and population control. And it's very important. Because it's at the nub of the meeting in Denver and is, at the same time, the bugaboo of this nation today with the pro-life and the anti- and the pro-abortion movement. And then the whole movement of uh, medical research, fetal research, and marriage and the family. It's all bound up in one ball of wax. Here's the situation. Since the time of President Nixon in the 70s, there have been a series of executive orders by the presidents of the United States, every one of them, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and Bush. Now, an executive order in these United States is an order that can't be gainsaid. The president makes it, and it is law to be applied. This executive order has declared that 13 countries are strategically necessary for the United States. And these countries are strategically necessary because they contain resources we haven't got and we need for our survival, mainly military, but then economic too. They contain large Catholic populations, like the Philippines. 
And the executive order says, we must be intensely occupied in population control. Keep the population down. Why? Very simple. All these countries are underpopulated. By the way, there's one country in Africa which is overpopulated. Demographers, when they speak about population, they consider a country underpopulated when the ratio of people to the land is such that the people can't work the land for their own sustenance. And most countries in Africa are underpopulated. There aren't enough people to work their resources. We don't want them to get sufficient population. Why? Because then they will be developed countries. They'll cease to be underdeveloped, UNDCs. They'll cease to be LDCs, low development countries. They'll become viable and then they have command of their own resources. And what about our strategic necessity? So this document, which is now public law, and has increased our spending of billions of dollars on Planned Parenthood and on birth control, sterilization, um, condoms, uh, all sorts, of, anything that can stop stem population is now the law. It says we have to limit population for our survival as the United States. It's actually become an international crusade. Yeah, because it's law. We, we have declared, Mr. Kissinger and Mr. Nixon first formulated this, we have to limit population for our survival. It is strategic. It is as strategic as possessing nuclear power. If we hadn't got the hydrogen bomb, we wouldn't survive. Similarly, if we don't restrain populations in these countries, we can't survive. Now, that's what the Pope is facing. When Clinton and he stood at Stapleton, uh, uh, Eldrum, and uh, the, on this podium, and the Pope, Clinton, haven't spoken. A nice deferential welcome, by the way. There's nothing wrong with it. He behaved himself, in spite of his origins. Um, the Pope spoke, and he made it quite clear where he stood on abortion. There you had the clash completely. The Pope would not yield. No yielding. And right through his whole visit, he stressed the same thing again with the young people and with everybody listening to him and the government listening to him, that I am here I am not yielding on it. And if you want war on the point, we'll give you war. But we will not yield on this. And um, this is the big clash between the two things, the geopolitics of faith and the geopolitics of reason. There's more to it, though. There's much more to it. Because there's a worldwide depression. Every country is affected, including us. Um, Solzhenitsyn said a couple of years ago in one of his letters that a country which has lost moral spirit can't last, no matter how rich it is. And today we know that the United States, our social order, our political order, is riven with corruption. We know that. The rise of crime, the absence of moral um, observance in marriage, the fact that uh, homosexuality is now enshrined as an alternative lifestyle. We, we, we have homosexual marriages, we're going to have much more of that. We're going to have the homosexual family placed on a par with the a normal family. In fact, heterosexual families are now regarded as funny. They're not as, they're not as up to date. And anyone who in any way criticizes this new order is immediately stigmatized They're and... Politically uh, incorrect and socially yeah. unacceptable. That's the condition of our, church, of our situation. Whereas the majority of Americans, and I'm sure the majority of Canadians, don't want that, but it's foisted by evil. And it's maintained in public because the organizations have been very, very clever at it. So we have that. Number two, there is no pre Christian principle governing international movements. We didn't go to Somalia for the love of God. Uh, we're not dealing with Bosnia and Herzegovina for the love of God. Otherwise, we'd have gone in and done something about it. We will tolerate any suffering. We'll tolerate another Holocaust. Let our friends, Jewish friends, remember. And they know it. We'll tolerate anything if that helps our national survival because we have lost direction. And there's no doubt about it. That's the evil and the immorality of America today. In spite of the fact the majority of the people are God-fearing, are good. The, in a day's walk in America, I'm sure it's kind of the same thing, you find good people. You'll find the odd, uh, the exception to every rule. But normally people are good. But they're, they're helpless in the light of the evil that has descended on us all. And that evil is very simple. The law of God is now observed. Education is being totally secularized. Children are being taught uh, uh, errors from the very beginning. And there's a new system of education taking place, OBE, out, uh, outcome-based education, which is totally unchristian and is meant to de-Christianize the masses of children. And let's take a look at the situation that the average uh, family is faced with. The average family is under siege. And 
you don't know from day to day if you're going to keep your job. Every day you pick up the newspaper and you read about hundreds of thousands of layoffs here and there and, and everywhere. Going, that's going to continue. It's going to get worse, not better. Economically, we're in trouble. And no matter what the new administration of the United States, uh, States says about its, its deficit package and new plans, we know, we know the deficit is going to be much greater by 96 than it is now. It's not going to be solved. And we're going to have suffering. Now, on top of all that, comes the geopolitics of faith. And John Paul II says, and he's told the leaders, over and above your economic difficulties, over and above your financial difficulties, over and above the economic depression, I must tell you that there are punishments coming from the hand of God. There's worse than the Mississippi floods. There's worse than Hurricane Andrew. There's worse than AIDS. There's worse than the explosion of Mount Helena. There's far worse. There's far worse. Some of them listen to it like Gorbachev. Some of them don't. But he keeps on telling them that. And this is only a prelude to it all. Unless you convert. Unless you convert to Jesus Christ. Because finally the king of the world is Jesus Christ. He must be acknowledged on every flag and in every parliament. And in every city. Do you think what, that's why this new world order doesn't seem to be working very well? well it's working very well from the point of view of the, 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 the uh, organizers. Money is won now. There's the one system of money, and the big decisions are made by few people and implemented in macro management worldwide. Oh, it's working, but we are not. Uh, we are not benefiting from that because we happen to be in the trenches. We're what my father called the, the poor bloody infantry, the PBI. <laughs> We're not the privileged ones, but it's working. The so they don't mind if there's hundreds of thousands of layoffs every no, day, no, no. or they, if uh, they don't mind the killings in Bosnia Herzegovina. They don't mind the Holocaust, any Holocaust, the Armenian Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, the Sudanese Holocaust, the East Timor Holocaust. We, they know all these things are going on. They supply the arms with which these Holocausts are performed. We do, they don't care about the drugs. American chemical companies manufacture the chemicals necessary for the uh, laboratories in Latin America, in, in, in Colombia and Peru, that make the drugs that are corrupting our people. They don't mind that. They don't mind that. That's money. So the New World Order is working perfectly, as far as the instigators of the New World Order goes. Is there a place for Christianity in the New World Order? None. 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 There is no place. To, there is for the moment. That's why they would like to get control of the papacy, by getting a man elected to it after their own hearts. Because there's no doubt about Roman Catholicism, even in its, in its, in its socio, socio, sociological condition today, is a... Is a, is a, is a is um, a, a source of stability. And if and the American government has tried, if it could get the papacy to lay off abortion, to lay off its, ad, its opposition to birth control, think of the boost we get in these 13 countries. The church propagating condoms, and the, the churchmen do, the church propagating sterilization, propagating what the Chinese do, limiting one child to one family. What a boost! It would solve the problem overnight. There'd be no more overpopulation. The battle would be over. Place for Christianity in the New World Order? No, not ultimately. For the moment, yes. Those who are managed in the New World Order see the Church in its structure, in its visible organization, as a source of so social stability. Its schools, its universities, its uh, people obeying what they're told to do. If you can get a hold of that organization. You literally control the lives of nearly a billion people. Remember, we are almost one billion people today, nominal Catholics. If you get that in train, under control, think of the, st the, the power you have. But for the, uh, the idea that these people would practice contraception, uh, uh, would not practice contraception, would not practice abortion, would uh, uh, insist on social justice for all nations and the proper distribution of wealth, uh, superfluous wealth, who would vote against the war, as a means of making money. Remember, the merchants of death make money on war, as they do in Bosnia Herzegovina now, as they do in Somalia, as they do in Indonesia, as they do in Africa, as they do in Angola, as they do in Latin America, as they do in Europe, as they do in Armenia. All that we wiped out. Oh no, that's uh, no place for that. Behind it all, Bernard, there is this mysterious thing, which we must touch upon. And we can't say much more than what I'm going to say. There's no doubt about it, that it's not merely that there are a crowd of men and women 
who are, strictly speaking, Luciferian. That is, they believe that this universe is dominated by an intelligence which is intracosmic, which is worldly, which is not God, it's Satan really. And that if they carefully follow the dictates of this spirit of intelligence, they will create a safe and happy world for some people, for themselves. But there's much more than that. We have sufficient evidence to know that within the Roman Catholic institutional organization, Satan has been enthroned. He has been given a place by his adepts and surrogates amongst the clergy and amongst the people. And John Paul II's, one of John Paul II's difficulties today is that he is frustrated because within the fold, within the sanctuary, as Paul VI said, there is now a positive influence by Satan who has servants among, him, among us, servants among the priests, service amongst the nuns, service amongst the bishops, servants among the cardinals. He is being served. And therefore he can frustrate the will of the Holy Father and the will of Jesus through the Holy Father. We know this. The historical circumstances of the enthronement of Satan in the Church of Rome is something else. But this is a fact we have to deal with. We can't get rid of it until Our Lady comes with great power. Because once you do something like that, once that happens, God doesn't act immediately. He, he's a macro manager. He manages things in the long run. And if men turn their back on him, he lets them turn their back on him. It doesn't force them back. And there is this now power within the church, satanic power. It's Satanist. And it is influencing our actions and decisions as bishops and as priests and as cardinals and as administrators of the church. Until Our Lady comes and cleans that out, sorry pal, we have to carry it and fight it. That's why Satan has such power today. That's why there's such corruption. That's why grace can't work. Remember the early missionaries who went to China and Africa, they found that when they went into a village or a, a group of uh, pagans, their first difficulty was physical. They simply they ran into physical difficulties because Satan ruled there. He didn't want them there. And uh, there's, uh, there are stories, of, uh, true stories, about trying to change the place names in streets from the name of a god to the name of one of the saints. And the ladder would be taken away from the man. He'd be fall down and break his neck. And uh, water was polluted. And there were physical difficulties because Satan does acquire physical power once you admit him to your household. And he has great power. Remember that the, the, the existence of Satanism in this country is an established fact that we have at least 8,000 covens, Satanist covens which include priests and nuns, as well as all priests. Do these people exist at high levels of government? Oh, yes, they do. They do. Without mentioning any names, they do. Right through the government, in the church and in the state, and in the states. So that we, there is a presence of Satan today, willed and accepted. You know what appalls us as exorcists in this part of the country? Up to about the year 1975, people committed errors and finally became possessed. A small amount of them invited possession. Today, we find over 50% originally invited possession. People are now saying, possess me, give me power, give me strength, give me pleasure. There's this new reign of Satan, and uh, he gets very angry when he's disturbed, because his best PR job is to prove that he doesn't exist. He doesn't exist. Whereas he reigns behind every, every bit of wainscoting, and in every bedroom and boardroom where people worship him and pay, pay attention to him. He has signaled victories like this, the fact that the, the North American Boy Love Association, the NAMBLA, is a recognized authority today. Is recognized, it's a public organization. And whereas the, the American armed forces now must have weaker chaplains, which, witches for chapl chaplains for witches. And they have a newspaper published by the expense of the American taxpayer. The, the, the thing is, besides homosexuality, there is Satanism. And it's rampant and rampant and respectable. Because the argument is, you're a Roman Catholic, you want respect, you want your chaplain, you want your newspaper, you want your bank balance. I am a Satanist. I claim to worship Satan. I have a right to have my bank balance, to have recognition, to have my place in the public square. And a right to have uh, those holidays off that are part that's of right. my that's right. religion's And uh, we, we, we're admitting that. So that's where we have gone so far. The point to be noticed by Christians and Catholics above all is that Satan has been enthroned. And poor Paul VI, through the end of his life, regretfully had to say, the smoke of Satan has entered the church, has entered the sanctuary, and is around the throne. He knew. He knew. Was this foreseen by Pope Leo XIII? Yes, it was. 
it was. And we know it all. When you examine all the evidence back in the last century to today, it all stacks up to the following that in the latter years, in the last decades, and the last decade above all, of this, of this century, the second millennium, Satan has a one last wild fling because Our Lady is coming. And he knows that's the end. That's the end of his reign. So his thousand years of freedom to destroy the church are, will be over by the end of this millennium. And this pope, this poor man, innocent and all he was, was chosen as Pope precisely at this moment. That's his fate, his terrible fate, that he was chosen to be the Pope. And after he dies, or after he, he's killed, or after he resigns, or whatever, then we have the morning of the magician. We don't know what's going to happen. We do know Our Lady will come and save us. Now let's take a look at something else that's happening that's probably related both to our discussion of the papacy and the dark night that's falling. It seems like old guards of any shape and stripe seem to be crumbling. People will pick up the newspaper and read, for example, that the monarchy in England is in serious difficulty, that institutions which dominated uh, America's uh, business scene like IBM are crumbling. Why do you think it is that all these old, age-old institutions are falling? Because the civilization which gave rise to them. By the way, the Roman Catholic Church created that civilization. Is at an end. It's the evening of the civilization. All the reasons for the existence of a monarchy with some decorum and some leadership power, some leadership role, they're gone. They no longer believe. They don't live Christian lives. They're no longer Christian in their behavior. They may have been baptized. They may not have. But the civilization as a whole, in its academia, in its public life, in its politics, in its war, in its peace, in its economy, is totally paganized. The civilization has ceased to be Christian. And the Catholic Church, which created a civilization, is dis the, the Roman Catholic organization which did, is disappearing with it, and with the monarchy. And hence we have an outbreak of what, what students are now calling tribalism. You have the Walloons and the Flemings in Belgium who want to separate. You have the Bretons and the French in France. You have the Italians who want to split up. We're going to start splitting up too. There are going to be separatist and secessionist movements in the United States. We'll it's happening already, both in the United States and Canada. Yeah, it's going to happen. And according as the economic situation gets worse, and people get more desperate, and resort to violence and arms, you're going to see much more disruption. And I'm always telling my own nieces and nephews, they don't believe me because they don't know, and they're all now, they're post-baby boomers. They were all born in the 60s and 70s. I always say to them, you don't know it, kids, but you have already lived the best years of your American lives. And you can say the same to people in Canada. You've already lived the best years of your Canadian life. You may not have liked it, but compared to what's coming, it was a paradise. But everything is breaking up. And that is because finally Christ has said, I'm turning my back on this civilization. It has ceased to be Christian, and I have no further interest in this race apart from my, uh, my, my sacrifice at Calvary and the salvation of men. And he's letting it break up. And you see, God has such power. Look, I can drink, I can eat, I can marry. But supposing I drink to excess, he doesn't send an angel and say, Malachi, stop that. No, no, he will allow me to corrupt my entire life and kill my body and go to hell for drunkenness. I can get married. I can also lecture. I can seduce and commit adultery and fornication. I can become a homosexual and get AIDS. I can kill myself. I can destroy my wife and children. In other words, Christ, if you misuse your powers, the natural powers given you, lets the misuse destroy you. He does not need to act. There's an inbuilt sanction, a sanction built into the world. You violate it, it destroys you. And that's his punishment, his real punishment, besides hell. But there's a real punishment built into human nature. We violate our rules. We accept our homeless as such. We will not punish criminals. We corrupt our system of justice so we no longer have a system of justice. All right, what are you going to pay? More people will be killed. More babies will be violated. More women will be raped. More men will be beggared. More people will die in misery and malnutrition. More people will hate each other. There'll be more violence. The punishment is built into it, and that's really, the civilization has its own seeds of destruction. And that's what is happening to us today. 
this thing is falling to pieces. There's no longer any reason why I should be honest with you. No longer why I should honor your wife. Why I should honor you. Why don't seduce you or your wife? Take your money. Destroy you. Why not? It's a jungle. It's no longer the law of God. There's no longer no, a strong church voice. There's no longer a strong moral voice in my parliament. The parliament doesn't give a damn about Christ. The Congress of the United States doesn't give a hoot about the laws of salvation. Not a hoot. It will violate any law for its own advantage. And simply all other parliaments. Tell me one that doesn't. It doesn't exist. So the civilization is corrupt. It's no longer Christian. And Christ is saying, all right, the built-in sanctions are going to operate against it and destroy it. But when it's destroyed, I can build something else. <laughs> and he will build something else. But this time it will be the reign of Christ himself. That's the situation. So there's no getting out of it. And we'd better make up our minds that that's bad enough. But built into that is the battle between us, the war between us and Satan for souls. We are all, all responsible, primarily for our, my own soul and then for those around me. But don't get any grandiose ideas that you can save the world, change it all back. You can't. The Pope can't. Because this is a non... It's an ongoing one-way street. And at the end of it, there's a chasm. And the chasm is destruction of all that we have ever stood for, civilizationally and culturally. It's going out the, uh, out the window. We've bastardized our art. And we've bastardized our drama. There is no new, vivid literature growing up. There are no great poets, great dramatists, great writers, great philosophers. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a desert at the present moment. People often speak about the, the change from communism in Eastern Europe. People forget that for 75 years, and for the best part of 45 years, most of those millions were bastardized intellectually by the great lie of the communist utopia. They were mongrelized morally by no law except the law of force. They were corrupt socially. They learned not to work, not to labor not to make an effort, you couldn't change it. And suddenly, they're freed of all that. They can't recover overnight. Let's They're take a look at that situation, because some economists were predicting that as soon as the uh, monstrosity and the stupidity of the communist economic system disappeared, there would be an economic uh, renaissance and a boom of uh, unparalleled fools, proportions. Fools, fools, fools. They forget what Solzhenitsyn knew very well and said openly. A nation without a moral fiber cannot succeed with the best resources in the world because finally ideas have consequences and faith must be there to create something. It was never created by pagans ever. They never created anything big except in the life. Some faith, some religious faith. We haven't got any. God is expelled. And so there's this awful... Uh, struggle now to try and maintain some equilibrium in the middle of a world depression. And it's not getting better. Everybody predicts it's going to get worse. How worse? God only knows. We do know that in the middle of it all will come the chastisements that have been promised us, which can't be mitigated. And what are some of these chastisements that have been promised us? Widespread hunger, widespread war, disease, then awful things which are exceptions like three days darkness over the entire world baffling all our meteorologists and scientists who won't know what's happening, who will have various explanations, any explanation except the hand of God. There will be parts of the continent that will be washed away out to sea. There will be eruptions of volcanoes that are extinct for the last 20 million years. There are going to be family against family, disruptions of nations and of cities to break, it, break up. How easy it is to paralyze a city with its sewer system and its electricity and its water, uh, and its power, and its communications. Just destroy it. And we have already had a foretaste in the World Trade Center here, where they're going to blow it up. It's well, certainly any large uh, <coughs> city is a sitting duck now for any terrorist who wants to is. plant a, do a bomb in some uh, skyscraper. And, you know, I have a nightmare sometimes. I wrote about it in one book of mine. The people are sitting at their TVs, looking at St. Peter's, and that dome is imploded with a bomb and collapses. I, I have a nightmare that's going to happen. And we'll see it on TV. It will be destroyed. And that would be a symbolic of the collapse of uh, Western civilization, as that's you right. would know. And of the organization, the Roman Catholic organization. And when you look at it coldly and objectively, it doesn't matter two hoots, finally. God can manage all that. But that 
does mean that we're sitting on the brink of a coming catastrophe we can't change, we can survive, and it can be mitigated by prayer and patience and holiness. But we can't avoid it any longer. What can a family do to protect itself? Because I know people that, let's say, figure that some type of socialistic government is going to take over. We're going to be in a worldwide depression, and they're making all kinds of preparations that say they're trying to store some guns in their basement. They are investing in financial instruments to uh, make sure that they'll have enough when they retire. Is that, is that going to save them? No. No, it won't save them. It may help some of them survive physically, but morally about their children. What's going to happen to the children in the schools where they're taught pagan doctrine, where their outcome-based education makes them little robots? Because they're affective. The affective side of their character is under control. They've been taught to say yes and no according to the will of the state. And that's what's happening. Well, it's even getting to a situation where it takes a heroic uh, family just to hold itself together. It does. And it's going to be heroic. And it'll be more than heroic later, short term later. It may mean martyrdom. It may mean they will get rid of you by various means. You can get rid of people by evicting them, making it possible for them to earn bread, uh, catching them on violations of rules made about their children's schooling, about finance, about their business. They, they will be martyrs. They, they finally will be martyrs. And anybody who wants to rear their children today must homeschool them to some degree. It does no good school any longer. Not really satisfactory. You've got to homeschool them, uh, besides laying the grid to these institutions. Are Christians perhaps entering once again into a situation which uh, they first faced uh, during the first uh, the three centuries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are expelled. And today, in any normal dinner table in Manhattan or in Los Angeles or uh, Atlanta or Chicago or Paris or London, if you dared say anything against homosexuality, if you dared say anything about abortion or fetal research against these things or criti critiquing them, you won't be invited back. It's bad form. If, you, if somebody says, well, he's going to see his mistress, you're supposed to take that as marvelous. It's, or somebody says that, well, he's come out of the closet and he's a homosexual and uh, he does this, that, that. You're supposed to accept that as saying that, well, he's changed his club. <laughs> he has, uh, you know, joined a new, uh, a new organization. Uh, the, the, today, we, and if we protest, if we say, no, I'm a Christian, I can't, I can't have anything to do with that, you're avoided, you're ostracized, you're regarded as funny, as a fanatic, as politically incorrect and socially unacceptable. Is there perhaps a new form of totalitarianism, not in the sense that uh, Hitler or Stalin were, but it's kind of a oh, yeah. silent psychological oh, yeah. oh, yes. oh, yes. uh, totalitarianism? Oh, yes, and we'll, and we'll finally eliminate you, marginalize you. And it, Paul VI, to give him his due, did say that probably, not in his life, but probably, Catholics would become a minority on the fringe of civilization, marginalized. And we're already marginalized, by the way. In the city, New York, for instance, there isn't one Catholic voice speaking in municipal uh, councils. No one. Everything is decided on the principle of uh, the big dollar or the big pleasure. And uh, nothing, those who fool themselves, uh, uh, like the present authorities of the church, if they, if, they, if they are friendly with and nice with these people, they'll get what they want. I find out rapidly they get nothing. They're bastardized further and further and further and humiliated and eliminated finally. They have no power. So yes, it's heroic. It may lead to martyrdom. It may lead to martyrdom. Just to be Christian, just to be Catholic, just to rear your children. And uh, th there are laws now in the making where we make it practically impossible for you to homeschool. And we know that the, the wife of the President of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton, has said she's going to wipe out all homeschooling. Did she say that? Yeah. Yeah. Homeschooling, because it's interfering with outcome-based education. It's interfering with the control of the young people. And they intend to make these people serve their purposes of socialization and paganization. So they have... Um, kind of an agenda of social engineering no doubt about it that no, will no totally no uh, replace the no, natural order of society no doubt in the wide world about that no doubt in the wide world about it now 
at the same time, Bernard, at least in principle, it's quite clear what a Christian and Catholic must do. It's very difficult to do it because we have so many contradictory voices. Uh, we do more damage to each other as Catholics than we do to the outside world. We attack each other. Traditionalists fight against the progressives. Uh, people who follow Father Feeney are attacked by the Pius X people. The Pius X people uh, are attacked by the Pius V people and by other traditionalists. And there are general, then there are snipers and marksmen all around just taking free shots at everybody. And then there's a whole slew of so called heretical bishops who are ordaining their own flock. Uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary fact that we are trying to shoot each other completely kill each other off, instead of uniting as one solid bunch saying, no, we're all Catholics, this is what we hold. Let's band together. It's impossible to get them together. And on top of all that, then we have so many voices. And then people are doubtful about things. You have Vasula Ryden, this amazing lady, Greek lady who now lives in Switzerland. And she has her writings. They're loved by some and condemned by others. She's derided by many people and adored by many other people as a true voice of God. There's Mother Teresa. But then how do you understand Mother Teresa? Mother Teresa's sisters, they're taking care of a Hindu who's dying. They say Hindu prayers with him. Hey, hey, wait, wait a moment. What's that mean? Um, there are a few apostles that are clear. that are Catholic and Christian, like Thernfried von Straten, the, the bacon priest. There's no doubt where he stands. Paul Marx, there's no doubt where he stands. The present Pope, there's no doubt where he stands. But there are very few... Apostles, you can say, that is truly Catholic and Christian. There are very few of them. It's a mixed bag. You take the Knights of Malta, take the Knights of Columbus. They have ma members who are Masons. They have members who are active homosexuals. What is this? What is this? Are the Catholics? Are the Catholics, yes, but... The, so the, the corruption of the entire organization is confusing to people. And then you have so many seers, or videntes, as they're called in Spanish, so many people having visions and publishing them, with so many priests supporting them and so many priests against them, and you have traveling salesmen who have weeping statues and, and bleeding statues, uh, that finally, you know, and then the, the, the derision poured on all that by non-Catholics and the hate, uh, and then on top of all that you have the corruption of the clergy, the pedophilia that goes on. There's just another priest now caught, a Monsignore, caught in, in, in New York Archdiocese. So there's this, this con it's decadence, it's shambles. It's a, it's a common thread to all these groups uh, within the church. Every religious order is that it's based with a breakdown of unity. There's, I don't think there's a single religious Not order one. that hasn't Not been one. divided. Not one. Jesuits, Dominicans, Carmelites, uh, Franciscans, and they're all in revolt against each other, and then they also have opposition to the Holy Father. There's no unity any longer. There's no unity any longer. But can, humanly speaking, could there be one person that would come and restore it? I don't think it's possible. No. It must be Our Lady. It must be a supernatural thing. And she has... Isn't Bernard, let's be awfully frank, even if people don't want to accept it. We know the agenda. We know the agenda very clearly. We're going to go on slipping down the slope. We're a big thing. It's a long slope. But we're very near the edge of that chasm over which we finally topple. And we're going to topple over it. And there's going to be chaos. What they call nowadays ordered chaos. Chaos under control. And there are going to be natural calamities. As well as man-made calamities. Mistakes made by people. And finally there are going to be calamities that come upon us from the hand of God. And people will say, my God, this is not caused by nature. This is something else. And at the end of all that, our Lady will come, and there will be a sign in the heavens, meaning she has come. And everybody will see that sign. They will know it. They will know it calls them to their conscience. It doesn't mean they're going to be converted. It means that those who are already converted will get better. It means that those who are wobbling may, if they want to, be confirmed in their faith. It means that the others who don't believe and refuse to believe will say, we can despair. There's no way out. It's simply God putting people on notice that things have changed. But and is it also Christ saying, I give you one more chance? Yeah, 
it's 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 it, it, it's it's God saying uh, there's a refurbishment going to take place. I will have uh, an apostle in charge of you now, who is going to be an apostle who will have the power to change things, because he must give the power. And remember, with John Paul too, that poor man, Carol Wotiwa, he hasn't been given the power by God to change things. But there will be a pope, a leader of Christianity, arising who will change it all, because he will have the power built into him. John Paul II is supposed to preside over the decadence and the failure and hold things together as long as possible because there are people to be saved still. But the man who will do it is somebody after his death. Not the next Pope, but somebody else. And that's the mystery of what's coming in the future. And uh, all we can hold on to is the fact that we can say our rosary, we can receive a valid Holy Communion, we can be absolved of our sins by a validly ordained priest. We can die with the rights of the church. We can save our souls. We can protect our children to a certain extent until they leave us, leave the nest. We can save our souls. That's all we need do. I will not be asked anything more by Christ. He will not say, what happened to the church in your time? Why didn't the Pope do this? He will not say that to me. He won't even talk about the bishop to me. He'll talk about me. So ultimately, that's the only thing we've been promised, is our salvation if we, uh, if we hang tough. If we have hang tough and keep the law and maintain our Catholicism. So we're not necessarily promised a situation which we're going to have a thriving civilization. No, it's not going to be beer and skittles. It's not a milk run. It's, <laughs> it's a tough chore. As I say, I'm always saying to my nieces and nephews and friends, look, you've already lived the best years of your American lives. You may not know so, but it is so. Look around you. Read the signs of the time. You know, Bernard, it's a good thing to end up on the, the meaning of the word, the signs of the times. You know, Christ said to his, he said, you know, you're an evil and adulterous uh, generation. He told his contemporary Jews. And he said, you ask me for a sign. He said, tell me, wh why do you stop where you stop? At sunset you can say, well, tomorrow's going to be such, such a day from the reading of the sunset. In the morning you can read the wind, the direction of the wind, and you can uh, read the skies. You say what's going to happen during the day. And he said, you can predict political events for your political affairs, your economic affairs, military affairs. He said, why don't you read the other signs of the times about God? You're corrupt. You're sinful. He's punishing you bit by bit with the Roman occupation of this country of ours, the Judea. Why don't you read those signs and repent and he will save you? But you don't. Why do you stop where you are? And he said, this evil and adulterous civilization will be given only one sign, the sign of Jonah. The Son of Man will be buried for three days and will rise again. His resurrection is the only sign of salvation. If you don't believe in it, bye-bye, birdie. And that's much more important than reading all these uh, signs that you read about in the newspaper, economic indicators, and... If you have to, for your business as a broker or a doctor or an investor, do, or for looking for jobs for your children or for your family or for your wife and, uh, or your husband or whatever the case may be, that's fine. But the chief thing is, are you reading the signs of the time? Do you know where we are? Do you know what's coming on top of us? Have you secured your soul? Are you living with uncleanness in your life? Or in your children? Or in your wife? Or your husband? Or your employees? Are you cohabiting with evil? Are you entertaining Satan in his jackboots as he strides around our boardrooms and bedrooms and streets and parliaments? If you are, then bye, bye, birdie. You have neglected grace. You haven't read the signs of the times. So it, it's a... It's, it's, it's tough today. It's uh, either or. I must tell you, Bernard, that Christ has come to the point, as Bernfield von Straten said, he's deserting our tabernacles. You don't show me reverence. You don't revere me. You don't take necessary precautions to have a valid sacrament. I'm leaving you. I I'm walking away from you. You see, the point is, he doesn't need us. He desires to need us and wills to need us. But if you turn a blind, like the rich young man, he said, uh, he loved him and said, look, sell all you have and come and follow me. And the young man was very sad because he was very rich. And he went away sad. We have been discussing how difficult it is for a family to preserve itself and hold together uh, under the forces that are uh, working against it. What are some of these uh, forces that are working against it? A family, and how are how have families' lives been influenced in ways perhaps which uh, people don't even realize? Well, Bernard, now that we can look back over a sufficient stretch of time, like say 20, 25 years, it is now quite obvious to everybody that uh, there was 
a plan implemented to affect the public and private behavior of ordinary citizens. We now know that because those who formulated the plan have spoken very frankly about it. They set out to mold our language, to accustom us to see much more explicit TV, to get accustomed to violence as if it was normal, to see violent and disruptive sexuality portrayed on the video, uh, on the TV and in films, much more than our grandfathers or fathers would have admitted, or we would have admitted 40 or 50 years ago, and to change our mode of thinking and talking, and in general to lower the level of uh, moral and religious expression in language itself so that now we, our language has been vulgarized and we use words today we would never use before. For instance, I never expected to hear the mayor of New York talking about condoms in public. You just didn't do it. Or talking about the homosexual act in detail, which they do now explicitly. But my children, if I had children, would be taught that in schools with diagrams. And we have, most parents accept that. Sex ed, as they call it, is even in Catholic schools. Whereas in my day, if one of my teachers told my daddy and my mom that he was going to teach me sex ed, I, daddy would have knocked him down, I think. He wouldn't have, <laughs> wouldn't have accepted it. And rightfully so. And rightfully so, because he did all the teaching about sex ed we needed uh, with his large family of nine children. But we have customs ourselves to hand that into the hands of externs, to people who have not our religion and to be drawn up by people who live in faraway places like Albany for New York, for instance, the, the state education system. So that this is the first thing we have to fight against. There has been a plan to mold people's minds along a certain way, to de-Christianize them, de-Catholicize them, to a certain extent to de-Americanize them. Because now what's in hate of honor is reciprocity, uh, cultural, multiculturalism, um, uh, aid not the victim but the criminal. It's a funny turn of mind that the criminal has much more chance of pity and compassion than any victim, whether they're killed or raped or robbed or maimed or whatever it is. So there's, a, there's an attempt to change our minds so that from the principles of justice and of chastity and purity and rectitude that we, we were reared with. That's there, that's number one. That's one difficulty we're up against. Another difficulty we're up against is this that has now become very much uh, uh, it's it's worse than smoking in public. Uh, you shouldn't talk about religion. Uh, you can't even say, "Well, I'm, I'll have a silent prayer." That's that is offensive, apparently. For somebody to say, "Well, I, I'm going to say nothing because I want to pray silently," that's very offensive, especially in little children. That's uh, that violates the separation of church and state, apparently. And uh, similarly with things like abortion and contraception, if you condemn these things in public, where was your friends say that part of public behavior, uh, they, they normally the they people say, well, don't be so extreme, don't be so fanatic about this. Um, be, be real, because people don't share your point of view. Uh, but they can talk about their abortion and uh, their choice of women's, the, their women's choice, and my body is my own, uh, but you can't talk about the, the, the other side of it without being considered a fanatic. And that's the turn of the events, that it's become unfashionable to be religious. Uh, and if you are religious and people know it, they regard you as peculiar, as, as somebody on the fringe. You're not normal. You're not normal. And um, similarly as regards sexuality, the practice of sexuality, uh, the, today um, nobody is surprised when a young man and his fiancée sleep together for a year before they're married. Nobody can. In fact, if you say that they shouldn't, people will say, what's up with you? It's quite normal. <laughs> That's the snag. And parents have children sleeping at home who have their lovers in, their future husbands in, or their, uh, their lovers in, considered to be part of the liberty that their body is their own. So you have this difficulty, and it's peer pressure on your children, if you have children. It's a very, very strong uh, peer pressure. Very let's, say, strong. I, let's say an example of, of it I run up against would ever suggest that uh, I and my wife may want a large family. You that's immediately right. get, uh, they look what, at you as if you have are, two heads. That's right. What are you thinking of? Or what, 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 I mean, they can't, they can't understand it. And then I have people, uh, young married couples, say, no, we want to have a good time for the first five or ten years, and then we'll have children. And, I've uh, heard that many times. Uh -huh. 
and then they find out after five or ten years that either she can't have children or it's very difficult or they don't want them because money has got tighter and they don't see the way to pay for it. So it's, it's, they're always caught by their own sins, by their own errors, by their own commissions. Um, but these are the difficulties that are facing people. Then finally there is the fact that whatever sources of education there are, newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, they are anti-religious and they're uh, uh, and pagan. There is no semblance of Christian doctrine implied by them in the normal film. Uh, there's no semblance of... The, the most you can get would, would be what they call American values. And even those are distorted because there's always a political slant, left or right, to it. And uh, so the, the, the... Today, we're faced with the fact that the civilization has deteriorated into a non-Christian civilization. And you just keep religion out of it. Everything will be fine if you keep your religion out of it. Don't bring your religion into it. Be as religious as you want to in private, in, in the closet. But don't come out of the closet. And above all, don't expect us to accept it. And it becomes difficult to pass it on to one's children because they're exposed to in school. television, school, blaring yeah. away at them that yeah, this yeah. kind of uh, and, and ideas are old-fashioned. And the behavior of their companions, too, who regard it all as fuddy-duddy, uh, to be otherwise. And everybody's doing it, so why don't, why don't they do it? And then there's the love of... Uh, Toys, the love of pleasure, the love of, of excitement, the love of food, uh, and to do what they want, to be, have their own will. And their parents must become their friends, and not their parents. Cease to be parents and become their pals, which disrupts the whole idea of motherhood and fatherhood and sonhood and daughterhood. Uh, and, uh, and the family itself finally perishes. So these are the difficulties they're up against. And you know, Bernard, you and I know you can do all you can, you can get the best books. You can lecture your children, you can give them examples, but if you haven't got the grace of God with you, it won't succeed, because they must get grace. And that means they must practice their religion. They must learn their prayers. They must go to the sacraments. And they must be taught. They must be corrected. You must curb their passions. You must teach them that what the others do is wrong, or not for us anyway. And that's a very tough chore. Tough love is a very difficult love to practice as regards your children today because they're afraid of losing their children. They want to be loved by their children. Whereas I don't think parents, is, parents is, the destiny of parents is not to be loved by their children, but to be respected. Love comes later. Uh, but love, love is very, uh, tough love it must be. Now, they're part of the difficulties. they are worse than that, though, by way of difficulties, because uh, willy-nilly, all our nations, yours in Canada, mine in the United States, and all of them in Europe, are now engaged in a, a new world order where the rule is money and industrial expansion and commercial activity and commercial success where success is measured in terms of money and after that then in terms of the men or the women that you consort with not necessarily marry in your popularity in how much how rich you look how exotic you look, what sort of a, an exciting life you lead. There's no cultivation of virtues in public at all any longer. Nothing is lauded along that line. They will laud somebody who's a, a role model in, in golf or in tennis, but they're not role models for eternity. There's no spiritual element present in it at all. And that's all part and parcel of this complete reordering of world affairs around to commercial and economic success and the old values are gone. Let's take a look at this because it seems like both in the United States and in Canada within the last year there's been a changing of the guard. And it's, it's a funny darn thing that change of the guard because don't you see a parallel between say President Reagan on the one hand or President Bush on the one hand and Mr. Mulroney on the other hand they were cut from the same cloth one way or the other. Right. Even though one is an American and one is a Canadian. And similarly between the new uh, uh, person in, in Miss Campbell King in Campbell, Canada yeah. and uh, say President Clinton and his wife uh, Hillary who uh, has much of power if not a greater power than he is in the American presidency. They're both cut from the same cloth again. And they both have kind of a new concept of uh, morality. Absolutely new. The, uh, the Clintons are absolutely clear on their mind. If you want to practice homosexuality, they're going to help you. They're going to have a law for you. If you want to kill your baby, they'll finance you. 
right up to the third trimester. Uh, if you want to do fetal research on living babies, they'll finance you. Uh, so they have a completely different worldview. And in their personal lives, that seems to hold true as well, because in their personal lives, they haven't practiced like the old uh, morality in the same way. No. Let's say that the Bushes or the Mulroonies no, did. No, 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 no. That's all gone. They're not church-going, uh, uh, God-fearing Christian parents or, or or couples. No, they're not. It's very different from that. They are the new generation of the the, the really Christian trash. It's it's in a way it's it's the. The generation that has grown up in the post-Christian world is now right. taking power. That's right. That's right. The same thing in France and Germany and Italy. Same thing in Spain. There's no difference. It's universal. There's a change of role. And it's coming to the fore now of people who I don't think ever knew what a Christian civilization was. They, don't, they, they know it from afar. They were never part of it. And consequently, their direction of affairs is pagan. They, they try and understand that then when they see their own good is involved, they'll behave themselves. But they have no, they don't believe in it, they don't live it as such. And they see nothing wrong with killing newborn babies or killing uh, babies in the womb. They see nothing wrong with homosexuality. They see nothing wrong with fetal reserve, provided it doesn't cost too much. Uh, and as for the rest of the moral law, it's what you can get away with, really. But uh, don't be caught at it if necessary. And there's a crassness there, there's a certain crassness as regards uh, human life. There's lacks a touch of, of uh, compassion and gentleness, which is only found in people who are religious minded. Yes, and charity has grown cold. Oh yeah, it's frozen out completely, it's frozen embers, it doesn't exist. So that's what we're facing, and we can't we, we, we can't expect any other thing for the moment. It's going to get worse because this thing I was taking over because people are getting desperate. It's now getting very difficult to live. It's now getting very difficult to, uh, to manage things probably. Just to even to hold on to a job is becoming difficult for many families. That's right. That's right it is. It is. It is. And uh, the, I know a few families that sacrificed everything to retire to the country in various places in Canada and in the United States. But they're finding that they've got to get back to the city again. They can't find work. They can't find money. They won't be able to feed their children. Um, it's, it's a bad time from the point of view of that, it's a bit, and it's going to get worse. It's not, it's not going to get easier at all. So that's the situation in which we find ourselves. And um, either you take that in the spirit of faith and utilize the weapons of faith, or else you, you, I think you're going to be lost. I think you're going to go under, and your families, and your children, and then your marriage will go under finally. It'll be a, a hopeless world. and. Uh, there's another difficulty too, which you mentioned. This is about. Remember, you mentioned something about the squabbling, intra-Catholic squabbling that takes place. Yes. You see, you talked earlier about the fragmentation that's uh, uh, evident in, let's say, in Canada and the United States, where mm. people, let's say, think of themselves. Uh, we'll use the United States as an, as an example. They think of themselves not as an American, but as a black or a white that's right. or that's somebody. Right. That's right. That's right. They, they, they do. They, they fall into sub-tribalism, we call it. It's called tribalism by the demographers. But you see the same thing in the church now, too, right across the spectrum. It's fantastic. And when I look at and find out that the, the, the members of the, the Pius X Institute, Lefebvre's Institute, are fighting with the members of Pius V, who are fighting them, and then the followers of Father Feeney from Boston, now in New Hampshire, they're fighting them all, they'll be attacked by the others, and on top of that you have other various factions of traditionalist priests who have nothing to do with nobody, and it goes on and on and on, they're all firing and flailing away at each other in the most extraordinary way. And this, they should be really defending each other, uh, attacking those who are attacking the church, they don't though. They spend a lot of time writing against each other and attacking each other and disrupting each other's meetings. There is kind of a loss of perspective. There is. There is. There's They're all a... engaged mm. in their inter-family uh, squabbles. Each one wants to win. Each one wants to win. And there are several questions, I think, which would be useful for your listeners and my listeners to know about or to have thought about. One is the whole question of Archbishop Lefebvre. Another is the question of the Father Feeney group and what they're saying about uh, salvation outside the church. I think we should deal with both of those because they're big questions. Because I, I, for instance, I went out and gave a lecture to a certain organization here, a very well-known organization, uh, about the church. And I happened to say in it that uh, unless you're a member of the church, you won't be saved. 
which is normal Catholic doctrine. Oh, the priest nearly hit me. The priest and the chaplain, who was my host, and he tried to contradict me later on. And we had a huge discussion about that. So some clarity must be given to people's minds. Uh, what about a good Jew, or a good Mohammedan, or a good uh, Methodist, or a good, uh, a good Mormon? Uh, are they damned because they don't belong to the Catholic Church and have refused it or never heard about it or anyway never belonged? Are they damned? If we say outside the church there's no salvation, where does that leave the room for anybody to be saved except those who are baptized Catholics? Because that, the doctrine of the church is there may be baptism of desire, there may be baptism of blood, we don't know. We only know baptism of water. And that means that a priest or another human being stands over you, pours water, while saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If they don't do that, strictly speaking, dogmatically speaking, you're not saved. You can't enter heaven. You may go to some lower order of things, some limbo, but you can't enter heaven. You can't see God forever. And what about the babies that are born dead? Or the stillborn babies? Babies aborted? What about all the embryos, their souls, their babies too? What about all those? Are they all condemned to the outer darkness? Is that what God's mercy and compassion is all around? So it's a wide swath. And then there are millions, uh, literally, as, as, as Carl Sagan would say, millions and billions of beings in China and Japan and India who, who never get near the church, never get near Christ, never get near the Blessed Sacrament, never get near confession, baptism, never. So it's a big question and has tortured the minds of theologians since, since the time of Columbus, because that's the first time it hit them there was a problem about the salvation of people who are not baptized. Now, as regards the doctrine of the church, it is a very simple doctrine, really. It's this, that if you're saved, I don't care if you are a, a, a voodoo priest in Haiti, or if you worship the sun god in Tasmania, or if you're a pious Jew, or a not-so-pious Jew, or a pious Mohammedan, or a not-so-pious Mohammedan, whatever you are, if you're saved, it's because of the grace of the Roman Catholic Church, because the only one source of grace in the cosmos, that is the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, as the mystical body of Christ. You can't get grace otherwise. Now, if that's so, how does it work? Well, the Church says that it works like this. If you are a good non-Catholic, a Methodist, or a Haitian uh, voodoo priest, or whatever you are, if you observe your conscience successfully, it's very difficult without grace. St. Thomas says it's practically impossible. But supposing you do, and you die in that condition, then God, in virtue of what you've done, without any help from him, he hasn't let you see a priest and be baptized, or get a chance of learning about the doctrine of the church. In that case, because of that, he will grant you the grace of the Roman Catholic Church, so you're still saved because of the Roman Catholic Church. You can't be saved independently of it, because it's the only source of grace. That's the rule, and uh, there's no exception to that. And uh, we must touch on one thing, which will walk on somebody's toes, but it must be touched upon. It's the question of the Jewish covenant with Abraham and God. There was an attempt at the Second Vatican Council, and since then, to say that the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant between Jews and God, was distinct and uh, uh, different from, and quite viable all by itself, from the Christian covenant. And therefore, the Jews needn't be converted and that they would be saved by merely being good Jews, merely that. That is Christian heresy. There is no such thing. The Abrahamic covenant was wiped out as regards salvation. But those belonging to the covenant will get a special grace because they happen to be Jews. But there is no salvation in the Abrahamic covenant. You cannot be saved by being, merely, merely being a Jew. And people don't want to hear that. They consider that to be anti-Semite. It's not. If it's anti-Semite, it's the doctrine of the Church, and the Church will not change. And that's the first thing about it. Uh, the second thing then concerns the, 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 uh, the doctrine, the, the, really the history of the, the supporters of Father Fini. They were condemned unjustly, and they were excommunicated unjustly. There was no excommunication, really. And four or five years ago, the Vatican told them there, there, there was no excommunication. Nobody would die to excommunicate. Father Feeney himself was not excommunicated ever. Nobody ever was. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. So that the, any idea of calling it the Boston heresy is a misnomer. There was no heresy. He was teaching the normal doctrine of the Church. Except that 
under pressure, he went to an extreme because he was fighting against people who denied it all. And uh, his expulsion and the expulsion of his brother from the Jesuits and his expulsion from the Jesuits and their condemnation was engineered by people like Cardinal Spellman and Cardinal Cushing who did not want to offend their Masonic friends and their non-Catholic friends. So it was totally unjust. And one day later, Bernard, not now, but some day later, the church will reinstate Father Feeney and say it was all a ghastly mistake. He wasn't excommunicated ever, either officially or unofficially. And the whole thing was a misnomer, was an anomaly, was a mistake, was prejudice, was slander and calumny. The man is probably a saint from the time at the moment he died. That's number one about the, the, the Feeney case. On the other hand, uh, the, the Archbishop Lefebvre case is something else. Was he excommunicated? And were his bishops excommunicated? And are all those belonging to and going to his masses throughout the world, are they excommunicated? Are they schismatics? Are they separate from God? If they die, do they go to hell? Um, can you go to a mass on a Sunday to one of their churches? and satisfy your obligation? Can you receive the sacraments from them? Can you be anointed them when you die? Can they bury you? Or is all that bad, bad, bad and forbidden? The answer is awfully simple. Um, only once did the church in that matter talk about schism, and they've never talked about it since. They stopped calling him schismatic because they know he wasn't schismatic. Archbishop Faber. They did excommunicate formally him and the four bishops, and the assistant bishop. But nowadays, nobody believes the excommunication was valid. Nobody, even the Romans. They know it was a, a formal uh, uh, action uh, designed to frighten people away from him, but that they weren't excommunicated. He didn't die excommunicated. In Rome, this is the normal thing said, admitted nowadays, behind closed doors. They won't admit it in public yet. In time, they will send out a letter or a document saying that, unfortunately, a mistake was made. And the impression was given that this man was excommunicated with all his bishops and his people. And it was wrong. They weren't. They were quite all right. That will come in time. But it will take time because the animus and the hatred of Lefebvre is still very high. Very high. And the official stance is he's excommunicated. But everybody knows he is. And then the Pope himself and several cardinals have already published statements saying anybody can go to their churches for Mass on Sunday, anybody can receive the sacraments from them, including confession and Holy Communion, anybody can be anointed when they die, anybody can be buried by them out of their churches. Now, they could not say that unless they were convinced there was no schism, there was no excommunication. So it's one of these Roman anomalies where the Romans made a mistake through prejudice and where innocent people have been lampooned. But it's left a scar on the past the 10th Institute. Now what's interesting is that the controversy of outside the church there's so there's no salvation and the Lefebvre controversy are two controversies that refuse to die. That's right. Yeah, they refuse to die and this is one of the things which, uh, which um, Lefebvre achieved. Uh, he, he said once, it's true, he was going to put a fish bone in the gullet of the Roman uh, bureaucrats. They couldn't swallow it and they couldn't cough it up. The difficulty is they can't change him. They, it's too well established economically and commercially and financially. They're independent. Rome can't withdraw their money. It can't take their buildings. The buildings all belong to a separate legal entity. And this is what angers the Romans about the whole affair. thing that he's untouchable. And they they're now talking now and again to him and ask him to come down and talk with the Father Schmidberger or somebody come down and talk to them and they say, yes, we talk, but the conditions are these and of course those Romans, those conditions are unacceptable to the Romans and therefore they, the talk break down. And then they wait for a while and then they come at it again uh, because the past the tense people are not going to give up. If they perish, it's by internal trouble, internal combustion, not because Rome takes them over. And if Lefebvre had given in to Rome in, in 19, I think it was 1986 this all took place, something like that, he, this society would not be dead. They'd have taken it over, liquidated it. The Romans would have. He saw the danger and said, wait a moment, we won't go along with this charade. 
Well, certainly he did put a monkey wrench in attempts to eliminate the Roman mass. Oh, he did, yeah. They, they, they can never eliminate the Roman mass, uh, apart from Lefebvre. But now with Lefebvre's crowds, practicing as in propaganda, I see, having a huge following, running into the millions, financially secure and independent, in several nations all over the world, with a certain unity about them, they're beaten at their own game. They can't do away with it. And uh, therefore they set up the Ecclesia Dei and had the indult, the mass indult, um, which are only excuses, really. And they have the fraternity of St. Peter for organizing, ordaining priests. What is interesting is that there's been a whole generation <coughs> of um, young people who have grown up in the post-1960s mm. liberal mm. era after the changes are made in Vatican II, after the revolution that swept through our secular society mm. in the mm. 1960s. Mm. And these are people who are attending the traditional mass. They may be going to the kind of meetings that uh, were in Denver. That's right. They haven't been totally corrupted no. by this uh, wave of uh, liberal... Uh, no, on the contrary, they're, they're very conservative, uh, strictly conservative citizens as well as Catholics. They won't be corrupted, but they're very adamant about it. And they insist on saying we're part of the church. We're a living part of the church. We're the best part of the church because we're keeping the ancient right. And um, and they can't be eliminated. They can't be eliminated. This is what angered the Roman bureaucrats. This really angers them and still angers them because if they could buy it out, if they own the land, if they own the money, if they could close the seminaries, but they 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 Lefebvre are getting nuns and vocations and priests and they're founding schools. And they're going on. And they'll, they'll go on living for a long, long time. And they'll cohabit with Rome for a long, long time. And they're not going to give in. And they're very fervent. A lot of them are very young, therefore they don't know the cost of being fervent. But that's, that's what the, the situation in Rome has. And Rome has stopped talking about excommunication and about schism. It doesn't talk about those things in relation to it. If provoked, it does, but it won't normally start insisting on this, because they know there's a very murky question there about the excommunication, and that they can't call them schismatic, so they're not in schism. They're not in schism. They support the Pope much better than most bishops do. They're very faithful to the Pope. They declare he's the Pope, he's infallible, he has primacy of jurisdiction, he's the overall boss, he's not merely a peer amongst equals. A lot of the, the bishops and cardinals themselves well, certainly traditionalists in general do a much better job of adhering to the Church's teaching on contraception than much, do much, the oh, yeah. uh, regular Catholics. Oh, much better, much better, much better. So that the, the one has got to be very careful about the, both the, uh, the Father Feeney doctrine and about the saying that the, uh, the past the Tenth people and past the and, uh, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre's crowd are all schismatics and heretics. And should... Thank you, Father Martin, for taking part in these interviews. Before we close, I'd like to give an address where our listeners can get a hold of your books. And these books can be purchased at Angelus Books of Barrie, and the address is 38 Jills Court, Barrie, Ontario, Canada, L4M4L7.